Good evening to all our urology colleagues from SAR countries and good afternoon to all our friends from Europe and abroad. On behalf of organizing team, I would like to welcome all our esteemed faculties and participants to the fourth SARC Association of Urological Surgeons webinar on overactive bladder, which is organized by uh, South. And this digital platform is an unconditional support from Sun Pharma. I'm very much thankful to our executive team of South, especially Dr. Madhu and Dr. Rajiv, who who were instrumental in planning and organizing in the organizing this event in this capacity. On our heartfelt appreciation goes to all our faculties who are experts in the field of neurourology and overactive bladder. Today, to be more specific, we have masters and great teacher of neurourology with us, and I'm sure we are going back with lots of academic loads and our knowledge is thoroughly going to be updated on this very tricky and difficult clinical condition known as overactive bladder. Uh, if you allow me, I will start the session with a short um, introductory or the history of our association. The SARC Association of Urological Surgeons is a very young association of urologists and allied healthcare professional from countries of South Asia. Its existence was declared at Sri Mangal, Bangladesh on February 20. 19 only. So we are too young. We as a SARC countries share the same disease burden with similar socioeconomic stand and virtually equal capacity of healthcare deliveries. So it was high time for us to get united for the benefit of our own patient. This now has become the platform for all our urologists in this region for learning, sharing their experiences and on long run can be involved in many scientific researches related to urology for the benefit of our own people. The first executive committee for 2019 to 21 was formed by executive members meeting held during the UAA Congress at Kuala Lumpur. We also had our first and inaugural Congress at Kochi, India, along with the UCCon last year. During this difficult period of COVID crisis, we also decided to take our scientific meetings into virtual platform and many webinars and meetings has already been successfully conducted under the aegis of South. Finally, today we are having our fourth webinar on overactive bladder. We choose this particular topic very prudently to uncover the myths and to reinforce our understanding over a very tricky and problematic condition in our clinical practice. Neurolo urology is still a difficult domain for most of us. I'm sure the knowledge that we had particularly related to bladder physiology is just a drop of water in the entire pond and our quest to fulfill this thirst of knowledge take us to this kind of platform where masters share their knowledge and we as a learner get benefited. We, today's session is divided into three sessions. First two sessions, we are having deliberations from our esteemed faculties along with the expert comments. After finishing all, we are going to have a small question answer session. So I request all the participants to send the queries to us and, convey, and the convener of today's webinar, Dr. Madhu, will try to put all your questions forward for the expert opinion. So welcome everyone once again. And now I'll request our president, Dr. Madhu S. Agrawal of SARC Association of Urological Surgeons and convener of today's webinar to put forward his welcome address. Uh, so I request Madhu sir, please to forward your welcome address. Well, friends, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this fourth webinar of the SARC Association of Urological Surgeons. As uh, Dr. Pavan has so lucidly explained to you, and all of you are already aware, uh, SARC is a very new body. We have actually been planning to develop this platform for many years, but uh, eventually it came into being only recently. Uh, this uh, uh, 
has actually brought to fore our common problems and we are constantly working towards finding solution to our common problems uh, i will keep myself brief because dr pawan has so nicely summarized everything already and uh, we have a uh, very eminent faculty today from all our star countries uh, to okay. discuss this very interesting subject and we have international faculty in in dr helmut from austria and uh, uh, dr chris chapel from uk uh, to deliberate on this subject uh, in these uh, difficult times uh, the corona crisis is taking a toll upon all of us uh, it is keeping us all apart but it is also bringing us all together uh, through these uh, 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 remote uh, connecting devices so thanks to these webinars it is it has given us an opportunity to be together uh, i will not take too much of your time and i will request again dr pawan to introduce our faculty and get the thank you very much thanks for i think next one no no right no next uh thank you dr madhu agrawal president of sark association of urological surgeon i really feel honored to introduce today's esteemed faculties some of them are the masters in the craft of neuro urology practice and world knows them as an authority in the field of neuro urology so dr madhu president of south needs no further introduction he is the key person in planning and organizing this our associations in this capacity and i am sure in his leadership will go further high in this in our regions not only in this our regions but will keep our presence in most of the part um myself dr pawan raj saliste have been serving this association south as well as nepal association of urological surgeon in the capacity of general secretary and i am associate professor at the institute of medicine tribhuvan university kathmandu nepal dr rajiv tp well known and active honorary secretary of urological society of india and treasurer of sark association of urological surgeon today he is presenting pharmacological management of overactive bladder on today's sessions uh, there is no doubt that he is the key person in planning and executing many of our academic session dr toid husain is our another faculty he is a young active secretary of bangladesh association of urological surgeon he is associate professor at bangabandhu sheikh mujib medical university dhaka bangladesh he is very active in promoting urology education in the sark region dr helmut madas batter needs no introduction he is current president of international neuro urology society and he is also a professor at the department of neurology in neurology at university hospital innsbruck austria i found innsbruck is a fifth largest city at the austria and it's a very beautiful uh, welcome sir today he is enlightening us over post qrp detrusor instability and taking part as panelist in difficult case scenarios uh, we are fortunate to welcome him last year at pokhara during our uh now national conference and we were really impressed with his knowledge and the teaching skill he conducted a workshop in neuro urology for our resident too professor uh, christopher r chapel is well known among us he is current secretary general of european association of urology and consultant at sheffield teaching hospital his knowledge and understanding on reconstructive urology and functional urology made him a world renowned authority today he has extended his apology for not being able to come live for this session due to some unavoidable situation but he will be with us via his recorded video dr rizwan hamid uh, welcome sir he is a consultant urological surgeon at the university college london hospital so he has lots of contribution on this sub speciality of functional urology uh he served as a director at the ics school of neurourology is a board member at the eau functional urology section 
board member as the EAU neurology, neuro urology guideline panel, and he had lots of contribution to this subspecialty. Today, he is participating as a panelist in our case based discussion. Uh, we all would also like to introduce uh, our colleague from Bangladesh Association of Urological Surgeons. They are esteemed professors and they had significant contribution towards the neuro urology service in the country. Uh, welcome. Dr. A.K.M. Anwar, Anwar Islam is professor of urology and he is the ex-chairman of urology at uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib uh, Medical University at Dhaka. Uh, today he is presenting on PPS with OAB, how to handle it. Similarly, Dr. A.T.M. Aman Ullah he is a professor of neurourology at BSMMU Dhaka and he is presenting on clinical presentation of OAB. Similarly, we'd like to welcome Dr. Khushid Alam from Dhaka, and he is professor and chairman at BSMMU. Welcome, sir. Similarly, we have um, uh, faculties from Urological Society of India, Dr. Sanjay Sinha. He is well known uh, is, uh, to us, and his contribution to this subspecialty is tremendous in our subcontinent. He is working as a consultant urologist and transplant surgeon at Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. And today he's taking the most important role as a moderator in the difficult case scenarios. So he's putting us through difficult cases and our panelists are helping him to solve the situation. Similarly, Dr. Pawan Basudeva, uh, his contributions and uh, we uh, toward this subspecialty is also tremendous. He's working as a professor and head unit head at the Department of Urology and Renal Transplant at Saptarzang Hospital, New Delhi. And he's presenting on management on refractory OAB today in second session. Uh, we'd also like to introduce Dr. Arbin Panda, who is senior consultant at urology and renal transplantation at Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, Sikandarabad, Telangana. We had a couple of sessions of uh, publications and the uh, um, GIU sessions with us in our reasons, and he's very active young and dynamic urologist in India. Uh, similarly, we are being presenting two of our young and dynamic urologists from Nepal Association of Urological Surgeon, Dr. Suman Sapagai, who is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Urology and Kidney Transplant Surgery at TU Teaching Hospital. Today, he's starting our session with etiopathogenesis pathogenesis of OAB. Similarly, Dr. Bipindra G.K. Rice, or, 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 who is working as a consultant urologist at Civil Service Hospital, Kathmandu, and he is the panelist. He is one of the panelists in the difficult case scenario. Similarly, I would like to, uh, it's, I feel really privileged to introduce our colleague from Pakistan, Dr. Aziz Abdullah. Uh, he's a professor in urology at Liaquat National Hospital, Karachi. And he's one of the active members in Pakistan Association of Urological Surgeons. Similarly, our faculty from Sri Lanka, A.M. Malinda of Ave Sekhara, is a, who is a consultant urologist at District General Hospital, Sri Lanka. So with this short uh, introduction of our faculties, uh, we have to start our first session. Uh, so with the permission from Dr. Madhu, so I will request uh, Dr. Suman Chapagai to start the first session. And I would request him to present etiopathogenesis pathogenesis of OAB. I also request all the speaker to stick with the time and uh, please uh, use your allotted time. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Pawan, uh, for your nice uh, introduction. So I am today opening up with the topic of etiopathogenesis pathogenesis of overactive bladder. Uh, is it visible? Yes. Okay. So overactive bladder is uh, defined as urinary urgency, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia with or without urgency urinary incontinence uh, in the absence of urinary tract infection or other obvious pathology. So this syndrome consists of increased daytime urinary frequency nocturia and urgency and also may be associated with uh, urgency urinary incontinence. There are few conditions which should be uh, ruled out or uh, very important that like uh, this overactive bladder is a sim uh, 
disease of symptoms but uh, detrusor overactivity often it is like inter used as interchangeable terms is not so because it is urodynamic uh, diagnosis similarly with bladder pain syndrome which usually is associated with pain and uh, it differentiates from the overactive bladder by the presence of uh, urinary incontinence so when we think of etiology of this disease it's exactly unknown but uh, it is multifactorial aging is one of the most common uh, cause and uh, uh, the partial bladder outlet obstruction especially in male in the um, prostate uh, is the most important factor racial or ethnic it may be associated but it is still not proven psychological and psychosocial factor is one of the most important factor uh, especially the depression and uh, anxiety is the most common and other factors like bowel dysfunction metabolic syndrome and hormonal changes is also contributing uh, for the uh, disease so let us go to the briefly to the pathophysiology as this is a disease the alter disease of alteration in physiology so we uh, i would like to go a little bit of physiology and uh, in between uh, we'll discuss the pathophysiology so it is multifactorial and multilayered so which across all level of the neural control and there is no animal model of overactive bladder because uh, it depends on the subjective symptoms so we revolve around the uh, the overactive bladder revolves around the sensory or the afferent signaling pathways and the contractile or the motor function which is efferent uh, pathway so this sensory information in ascending afferent uh, which is integrated at several levels of central nervous system forms the pathophysiological basis of the disease so this afferent input usually from the receptors of the urothelium and the sub urothelial layers uh, gets activated and the release of the mediators cellular interactions and release of different cytokines cause a signal transduction and uh, the different process of afferent traffic gating sensitization results in the overactive bladder so motor function the efferent pathway usually is concerned with the detrusor muscle motility so which is very important and this micro motions micro motions that is present in the bladder is uh, uh, important for the motor functions here we can see in this diagram on the left side the localized micro motion or contract contraction which is starting from a initial point you can see star here so this spreads into the limited part of the bladder wall this is in the normal bladder condition it is it is associated with only small fluctuation in bladder pressure because the non contracting part of the bladder stays relaxed similarly the uh, multifocal um, trigger points in the overactive bladder here we can see on the right side of the figure there are multiple uh, stars from where these uh, uh, trigger points are generated this enhances the effect on bladder pressure and it stimulates it stimulates the afferents by uh, extensive distorting movements resulting in the overactive bladder so the brain midbrain and the sacral spinal cord is uh, associated with the integration of sensory informations the sensory afferent signals are integrated with other structure the brain usually integrates it and the coordinator mo motor behavior executes as a efferent activity so midbrain and the pons are the main regulator region and periaqueductal gray and pontine micturition center integrate the key elements of vegetative function including the voiding reflex and sacral spinal cord is associated with the ne neonatal and neurogenic uh, reflexes and also some peripheral uh, interaction is also important so a delta and the c fibers are the different types of fibers which are located in the different epithelium through the afferent nerves this go traverses through the, the sensory inputs that traverse uh, through the uh, uh, central nervous system where it gets Uh, coordinated in the brain and then uh, it uh, executes as a efferent activity so the different mechanism of increased afferent activity because when overactive bladder is concerned these afferent activities are increased and there are two special um, the if there are two predominant hypothesis one is urothelium based hypothesis and another is myogenic hypothesis which is um, involved the urothelium based hypothesis here the mechanical osmotic or inflammatory are the stimuli 
alters the sensitivity of the cell membrane. These aberration, the intrinsic aberration caused by the etiological factors will trigger the uh, NOF signals and that result in the uh, overactive bladder. So in summary, in the urothelium based hypothesis, the urothelium actively responds to local mechanical, osmotic, inflammatory and chemical stimuli resulting in increased stimulation of afferent nerves. Similarly, in the myogenic hypothesis, there is a spontaneous excitation within the smooth muscle. This causes overactive detrusor contraction. The nerve uh, there is patchy denervation, and the smooth muscle is deprived of its innervation. And there are structural changes which result in the uh, abnormal muscular um, uh, responses, resulting over resulting in overactive uh, bladder. So, in myogenic hypothesis, the overactive detrusor contractions result from spontaneous excitation within the smooth muscle of the bladder and enhanced propagation of this activity to affect an excessive proportion of the bladder wall. So here we can summarize, the, the, we can see the picture here in the, the, the base, the cellular integration. Usually the urothelium here traverses the, uh, the mediators. The, the different mediators are released here in the afferent region and it traverses through the sacral spinal cord, midbrain and forebrain, where the afferent nerves passes the stimulus and then control the emotional setup is maintained in the, uh, the maintain, is maintained by the forebrain. And then there is execution of the voiding by inhibition of the storage and disinhibition for the voiding, which results in passes of the uh, urine. So this thing is triggered by the uh, etiological factors which exas uh, uh, which exaggerates and there is overactive bladder so the abnormal handling of the ab abnormal signals afferent signals are by the afferent noise so even in non pathological state the continuous bladder afferent activity during the mixation cy cycle delivers a myriad of signals conveying pain mechanosensation chemical sensitivity and motor and or sensory function to the cns for processing so different neurological diseases also alters the CNS, uh, the, the behavior of the central nervous system to aggregate the um, uh, symptoms. And a few other things are also associated like hypoxia, oxidative stress, there's chronic inflammation, the changes in the microbial composition. These also results in the uh, overactive bladder. So to summarize, the failure of uh, uh, integration of efferent inputs and sensory inputs at the highest level of the CNS resulting from disease or dysfunction may lead to perception of normally unconscious symptoms as urgency. So the urothelium based and myogenic hypothesis are the two primary bladder centric theories behind the mechanisms of overactive bladder. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman, for a very short and crisp presentation on etiology of overactive bladder. Uh, we are also would like to thank you that you took the exact time of your presentation slot. Uh, now I request our um, next presenter, Dr. ATM Aman Ulla from Bangladesh Association of uh, Urological Surgeons to give us 10 minute talks on clinical presentation of OAV. Dr. Ulla, please. Dr. Aman, you need to unmute your mic and start sharing your slide. Dr. Aman, is there any? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it is coming. It is coming. Okay. Is it visible now? No. Uh, 
it said it's being starting so we need to wait a minute yeah now it's there is it visible now i am audible yes yes, yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So, yes, uh, I'm Dr. Ati Amanullah. I am uh, delighted to join today's topics, and I got to learn from this topic update of overactive bladder. Uh, respected Madhu, as our all and the our today's convener and the president, Sarg Association of Regional Surgeons, and Dr. Pawan, uh, our CLS, and this general secretary of the Sarg Association of Regional Surgeons, today's faculty of Sarg. and abroad and uh, especially i give thanks to the president nius helmet mother basar and the our moderator panelist and the members of sarc association, association of the surgeons good morning greeting from bangladesh so today uh, i like to thank dr shumon uh, chapagain for his brief and nice presentation on the etiopathology of the ov now i am discuss of the clinical features of oeb so you know the definition so overactive bladder syndrome is defined as a urinary urgency usually uh with urinary frequency and nocturia with and without urgency incontinence so in 19 2014 international consultant of international continence research society proposed that terminology is slightly rephrased as overactive bladder syndromes is characterized by urgency with or without urgency incontinence usually increased daytime frequency and nocturia is there is no proven infection or obvious pathology previously ob symptoms were described as a associated with the uh, unstable bladder a bladder contracting involuntary during the filling phase of a cystogram was also referred as a ductus or hyperreflexia if urological disease was present or detrus over activity if there is was unknown or non neurogenic so basic evaluation of the oeb depends upon on the on the history the, that is the total duration of the disease severity degree of bother type of fluid intake water coffee coexisting other diseases medications and operation etc and it is also important the physical examination that is general physical examination abdominal pelvic tract examination bladder diary urine analysis and urine culture and post bladder urine clinical features history the uh, it is well said by the suman the male and female both are equally affected and frequency increases with age and old female get more oeb urgency and urinary incontinence this urgency the hallmark of oeb oeb is diagnosed mainly the symptomatically so urgency is the sudden compelling desire to pass urine which, which is difficult to defer the by saying a question such as when you get the urge to bite can you do it or when you have the urge to bite you can make it go to the bathroom or do you have the urine leakage urine leakage without warning or maybe with urgency this is socially embarrassing and social problem and problem with work it is a frequency you know that that is the uh, usually In the daytime seven to eight times is the normally it is frequency and nocturia that is due to wake to bed it is preceded and followed by the sleep so the nocturia should be differentiated from the nocturnal polyuria this is the pathological conditions sometimes confused with the stress incontinence one third of the patient is we we have the both the conditions so we know the this is the Sym symptomatic and the history is the important so we have to know the bowel functions about the patient the constipation fecal incontinence many decabulation of the uh, fecus and um, or using the suppository and the both the urologic uh, and the uh, sexual history of the same nerve innervations so directal dysfunction loss of libido ejaculation orgasm is very important some medical history there is a involved in the and uh, innervation of the bladder that is diabetes mellitus muscular sclerosis and also the tuberculosis histosomiasis these are the very important history obstetric and gynecological history the multipara uh, parturition abdominal hysterectomy is important urological history there is uti bpas interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome uh, 
sphincter damage after prostatectomy surgical history nerve damage during the uh, abdominal perineal resection trauma history urethral injury lead to the stricture urethral spinal injury due to the neurogenic bladder and pelvic radiotherapy for the carcinoma and degenerative diseases of the spine that is the cervical and lumbar disc disease spinal tumor and some cerebral condition like stroke and parkinsonism so the drugs are also important for the uh, history that is we are using um, patients are using many types of drugs some drugs enhance in the bladder emptying that is bladder contraction cholinergic drugs bethacolin carbacol or disease outlet resistant alpha adrenergic block drugs and some drug enhancing bladder storage anti muscarinic drug that is used in the overactive bladder and the diuretics for the congestive heart failure antidepressant drug tricyclic antidepressant we are used that reduce the frequency and control the nocturia and ostrogen therapy patient using for the decrease frequency urethral pain and urgency other medical issue about the poorly controlled close angle glaucoma cognitive impairment history of urinary retention and impaired gastric emptying are related contraindication to anti muscarinic therapies so wave symptoms overlaps with the some other common neurological conditions symptoms of wave have overlap with other condition most notably the urinary tract infection bph intestinal cystitis bladder cancer carcinoma c2 despite the shared symptomology to wave and uti the timing of the symptom onset is usually very important between the two ut uti symptoms are generally acute whereas the wave are generally chronic however dysuria and hematuria are not the features of wave really uh, while the frequent is seen in the uti urgency frequency nocturia rarely seen in the bladder cancer and carcinoma c2 when these symptoms do occur it is generally in the setting of micro hematuria the, this slide also is used and shown by the uh, shuman the frequency urgency and nocturia is a symptom of oeb but bladder pain is due to bps and not urinary incontinence uti is most commonly misdiagnosed condition among the women with uh, oeb we recommended relying in urine cultures and the constellation of the acute onset of dysuria frequency and urgency as the important diagnostic factor in the distribution between these conditions so stress urinary incontinence can coexist with the oeb dry giving rise to mixed symptoms of stress incontinence and urgency physical examination this is very very important but we most of the time overlook this physical examinations general physical examinations uh, patient assessment include the anxiety mood mobility dexterity of the patients and edema abdomen and pelvis especially of the lower abdomen is very important if there is any distended bladder so you have to feel the this is it is poorly or uh, defined or floppy that means it atonic bladder and there is probably no upper tract deterioration and when it is firm and tense so we have to think about the uh, upper tract deterioration examination of the genitalia metal stenosis phimosis fusion of the labia in case of female is, it should be examined there's an examination inspect the intraurethral genital atrophy prolapse movement of the bladder and urethra and check for urinary incontinence and vaginal capacity rectal examination for men inspection perineal sensation anal reflex anal tone voluntary squeeze fecal infection condition of the prostate and rectal pathology is important and as well as we have to examine the neurological examination all patient must have a simple neurological including gross examination assessment of the sensation reflex muscle function in the lower extremities in particular special and should be made to the sensory lesion of the sacral dermatomes the motor division of which and supply the bladder that is sector 2 3 and 4 anal tone anal reflex valvo calvonus reflex as we know this is we have to examine and check this one the neurological examination uh, as a result we have crudely grouped as a, into four the neurologically normal and 
some and lower motor neuron lesion that is with decreased muscle tone decreased power decreased reflexes absence sensation this is usually found in the lower spinal cord injury effect in the clonus medullaris upper motor neuron upgoing bevenskirtan increased muscle tone increased reflex muscle spasm absence sensation this is typically seen in the high spinal cord injury patients mixed uh, type is lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron such as spina bifida so the another important thing is the bladder diary this is the very simple and non expensive uh, we can do for the three days in the bladder diary uh, we have to look in the fluid in and urine out and comments and type of the drink and amount of the drink urine output time and amount how urgent the urination 1 to 3 3 is most urgent activity at the time during reaching the front door and leakage any way it was soaked so in the bladder there is a very important parameter recorded here the urinary frequency during the day and night functional bladder capacity the average volume recorded nocturnal urine output and diurnal urine output number of leakage episodes and degree of urgency and volume of fluid and liquid drunk so we use uh, several different questionnaire for the oeb most importantly in our bangladesh we use the oeb ss oeb ss symptom score uh, that is uh, here we uh, use the fourth thing that is uh, frequency and nocturia urgency and urgency incontinence so the frequency is 0 to 2 nocturia is 0 to 3 and urgency 0 to 5 and 0 to 5 uh, urgency uh, incontinence uh, yes i uh, you have crossed your schedule time by 2 minutes so do you summarize your presentation okay okay one, one minute just it is going to within sec minutes thank you pawan so the urgency sensation in scale is no urgency one mild urgency moderate urgency severe urgency and urgency incontinence urgency one is the convenience void so a void without desire to void So, and urgency percentage scale is uh, includes that possible response. I am usually not able to hold the urine, and I am usually able to hold it until I reach the toilet. Will I go immediately? I am usually able to finish what I am doing before the going the toilet. So there are some transient cause of um, incontinence, diapers, and there are some myth. You know the myth of the overactive bladder. Thank you so much. I am sorry for taking more times. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you, Dr. Aman. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Sumas. Yeah, uh, we'll, re we'll request you to stop your slide share. So we have to move forward with our next presentation. Uh, our next presentation, I would request Dr. A. M. Malinda Abbasekara uh, from Sri Lanka Association of Urological Surgeon to present on evaluation of overactive bladder. Dr. Avesh Sekhara, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the SAS Association of Urology for giving me this opportunity to present uh, about the evaluation of overactive bladder. And uh, uh, overactive bladder, actually, this, uh, the evaluation, most of the part has been already covered by Dr. Aman and the previous speaker. So the evaluation actually starts with a careful history. Uh, we have to uh, demonstrate that uh, actually the The urinary urgency, now frequency, now urea and those features we have to demonstrate in the history. And then uh, some patients may have urinary urgency incontinence, but some may not have. And uh, we have to exclude the urea and other objects such as this. That's according to the International Urogyne Organization and International Consent Society. So all these things already been discussed. And uh, then in the urgency, we have to. Uh, some patients will say that uh, they have to. If they are doing something important, they have to stop that work and go to the, find a place to pass urine. For example, in our country, that uh, patients who are traveling in the public transport, they have to get down from the uh, the bus to pass urine. That kind of uh, compelling uh, desire will come for them, and so we have to demonstrate those things in their history. And you need a frequency also. We have to get uh, that. Uh, during the frequency, we have to get the uh, patients. Uh, uh, 
and uh, the allocation the because with the climate also affect the urinary frequency and how much they drink and all these things and good uh, we can put good information from the hoiding diary about the urinary frequency and nocturia also they have to get up simply because that they have uh, sensation or the bladder sensation or due to some other thing, thing that interrupt the sleep so that we have to get and the uh, urinary urgency in continuous also we have demonstrated in the history I mean, uh, already as I have explained that comorbid conditions also we have to demonstrate uh, whether they are having, uh, sometimes they have neurological diseases, some they have mobility deficit, and uh, because of that they can't reach the toilet in appropriate time, and not because of the urinary urgency, because uh, they can't uh, have the, uh, they don't have the ability to reach the toilet, and some may have diabetes because of that, they will have uh, excessive production of urine, and some will have con chronic constipation, which will lead to uh, loaded colon and rectum, which will compress the bladder. And those things we have to in the system. And some will have chronic pelvic pain, whether they are having recurrent urinary tract infection. If they are having a uh, visible hematuria, then they have to refer them to the hematuria pathway investigation. And whether they have with a uh, prior pelvic vaginal surgery, some patients who are mm -hmm. having mixed incontinence, they will have. Uh, they will have, uh, the, if they had undergone safe procedure, they can have more infection that more overactive episodes after the uh, the safe procedure that can happen. And whether they have pelvic management issues such as bladder, colon, cervix, uterus, prostate, or pelvic uh, management which lead to radiation. Because radiation will lead to contraction of the bladder which due to the fibrosis. So they will also have overactive features. And female is significant for that. Some patients will say that there is a lump at the vulva, so we have been dosing in the history. And uh, we have to assess the degree of both that already discussed by the Dr. Aman, that there are different, different uh, questionnaires, validated questionnaires are available. So that can be used in the initial presentation. And or after starting the treatment, also we have to read in the questionnaire. So see whether the patient improves with the treatment. So, voiding diary already explained here yeah, that uh, in the voiding diary that we have to get the uh, at what time and how much we are drinking and what we are drinking. Because sometimes if they are drinking a lot of tea, coffee, and uh, carbonated drinks, they will have overactive features. And uh, how often they are drinking, uh, because sometimes some patients they drink more in the morning and uh, less in the evening, and that's because some, uh, so, uh, we can get good details from the voiding diary. And uh, uh, there's one patient presented with overactive bladder symptoms, but uh, he had previously had a uretic calculus. So he was advised to drink a lot of water. So when we did the uh, uh, voiding diary, he's drinking around 8 9 liters of fluid daily. So he's having overactive symptoms because of that. And uh, the one, amount of urine passed because uh, patients with overactive bladder, they will pass more quantities of urine more frequently. So that also we can get from the uh, bladder diet and uh, we have to get the that they are leaking or not also we have to ask in the bladder uh, this frequency to link huh? you can get good details from this diary and then the uh, physical examination to see whether they have any or enlarged prostate whether they have previous surgery or whether they are having uh, enlarged uh, other signs of other diseases and some patients with atrophic vaginitis also can present with overactive blood. And minimental score also we can do uh, patients who are having uh, risk of cognitive impairment. Then you can assess their cognition. And urine analysis to rule out the UTI. And if they are having a uh, material, then you have to refer them to the material pathway. And urine culture is not mandatory for all of the patients. And if they are suspecting infection, we can refer. Uh, we can do the urine culture. And post wise epidural volume also not for all the patients. And uh, initial behavioral modification and patients who are receiving antimuscular treatment, they can uh, start the initial treatment without doing the post wise epidural. But if the patient is having six factors for retention, like uh, old age, male patient with enlarged prostate, then we can do the post wise epidural only before starting antimuscular treatment. And urodynamics. We can do urodynamics only for the patients who are receiving initial treatment 
for patients who are not responding to the initial medical treatment. In that case, we can do the urodynamic assessment to demonstrate the uh, detrusive overactivity. It's not done in all the patients, especially because in our country, the facilities are not freely available. And cystoscopy is because sometimes uh, carcinoma in situ also can present with the CK suggestive of uh, overactive bladder. In that case, uh, for the, the suspected patients, we can do cystoscopy. And diagnostic renal and ultrasound, bladder ultrasound scan, uh, not for the all the patients, but selected patients we can do. And uh, thank you very much because most of the other things have been covered by the previous speakers. And thank you very much for the faculty giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Malinda. Uh, uh, we, we received a few of the technical problem from a uh, few reasons. Uh, and uh, we are trying to sort out with that along with our technical team. We'd like to extend our apology uh, if some of our um, live transmission is not getting or reaching up to you. Uh, I think uh, technical team has already um, troubleshoot that thing and uh, we are already now having a smooth running of this program. So I would like to continue our program. So I would request next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Aziz Abdullah from Pakistan Association of Urological Surgeon, and he's uh, presenting on behavioral therapies for overactive bladder. Dr. Aziz, please. Uh, so, so is Dr. Ajit with us in the platform or because of the technical reason, if it had, he had been logged off. So I will like to continue our next presentation. Uh, so I'll request Dr. Rajiv TP to present on the pharmacological management for overactive bladder. Dr. Rajiv, please. Good evening, everyone. First, I will uh, thank the SAR <coughs> Association of Urological Surgeons for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic. My topic is on pharmacological management of overactive bladder. The overactive bladder is really gives a help for the suffering patient. It significantly impacts the QAL and this is mostly the status of a suffering patient who runs frequently to the toilet for urinating. And uh, the patient also has sudden urge to urinate that is difficult to control. And uh, there is involuntary loss of urine and has to wake up many times at night. Now, detrusor overactivity is a neurodynamic observation. This is characterized by involuntary detrusor contraction during the filling phase, which may be spontaneous or provoked. OAB and detrusor overactivity are not interchangeable. One should know, one should be able to differentiate overactive bladder with urge incontinence from stress incontinence. This matters. This matter is of utmost importance. Overactive bladder and urge urinary incontinence in this case, the, the bladder muscle experience frequent involuntary contractions, whereas in stress urinary incontinence, bladder muscle experiences a stress-related contraction, and at the same time, the support muscles are unable to remain completely shut, resulting in urinary leakage. The treatment goal in overactive bladder is to eliminate or reduce, or reduce the urinary urge incontinence, reduce urgency and frequency episodes, and to ensure treatment compliance for a long-term benefits. 
as well as to meet patients' treatment expectations. The management of over, overactive bladder is mainly centered around the behavioral therapy, pharmacologic therapy, and combined pharmacologic and behavioral therapy, which has resulted in improved outcomes. The first line therapy is always the behavioral therapy, which will be touched upon by my colleague, who is the next speaker. Then <clears throat> when two uh, elderly ladies who are having suffering from overactive bladder, when they meet each other, the frequent discussion is, I have reached that age where I have given up on mind over matter and I'm concentrating on mind over bladder. So it has been found that behavioral modification alone can give significant more than 50% reduction in incontinence. And when it is combined with medications, the <clears throat> it can bring about more than 85% reduction in incontinence. Whereas medical therapy can alone reduce the incontinence episodes to more than 70%. And the, to conclude, combined drug and behavioral therapy in a step program can produce added benefit for patients suffering from OAB with urinary urge incontinence. So pharmacologic therapy is the second line therapy in the management of overactive bladder. It predominantly include anti-muscarinic agents as well as beta-3 agonists. Patients should be educated about potential side effects, including dry mouth, constipation, visual impairment, etc. These pharmacologic agents act by reducing and intense, reducing the frequency and intensity of involuntary detrusor contractions during the filling phase of the bladder and helps in increasing the functional bladder capacity as well as the bladder compliance. Treatments are normally limited by the adverse effects associated with the cholinergic agents so that good percentage of the patient leave the therapy and are not getting the um, significant relief from the symptoms. Drug therapy is becoming increasingly important and currently the mainstay in the treatment of overactive bladder Anti-muscarinic agents are the gold standard. So cholinergic receptors are basically classified into nicotinic and muscarinic. And we are concerned with the M3 receptors, muscarinic receptors, which are more concentrated in the bladder. There are a variety of anti-muscarinic agents, which we have been using over the years, starting from oxybutynin, deltoridin, oxybutynin, transdermal delivery system, darifenacin, solifenacin, trospium chloride, Festoridin and imidafinacin. So these are the muscarinic receptor distribution and they are distributed all across, that is M1, M2, M3 receptors. That is why all the muscarinic agents have a variety of adverse events ranging from dry mouth, constipation, dizziness, visual impairment, et cetera, et cetera. So what will be an ideal muscarinic receptor antagonist? These should be efficacious that it should inhibit involuntary bladder contractions, does not adversely affect the voluntary detrusor activity. At the same time, it should be organ selective, that is preferentially affects bladder over the other organs. It should have minimal side effects so that, and so that it improves the tolerability of the patient and have a better tolerability so that there is improved compliance among the patients. Tolterinin <laughs> sustained release in the tre treatment of overactive bladder. This was a 12 week multi institutional study wherein Tolterin SR4 milligram once daily and Tolterin 2 milligram twice daily with placebo were studied in a wide range of patients. And it has been found that Tolterin SR significantly effective in improving incontinence episodes per week, total micturations per 24 hours mean voided volume per micturation and significantly reduce the number of pads used in 24 hours. Solifenacin is another agent. It is a specific M3 receptor. It's used in a once daily dose and it can offer 24 hour control over the urinary bladder smooth muscle tone. It also acts as an urinary antispasmodic. It is advocated in the treatment of overactive bladder with or without arch urinary incontinence. This is a Venus and star data from clinical trials. 
wherein they have concluded that there is a statistic, statistically significant superiority of solifenacin compared with placebo. And solifenacin is the agent of choice for overactive bladder related incontinence with an improvement of more than 50% incontinent patients reporting no incontinence episodes after 12 weeks of the therapy. To conclude, solifenacin could significantly decrease number of urgency episodes in a day, the maturation episodes per 24 hours, incontinence episodes per 24 hours, night reduction in the nighttime maturation, and urinary urgency episodes per 24 hours, and improve the volume voided per maturation as well. It has got a favorable safety profile, considered together with its known efficacy in reducing key overactive bladder symptoms. It has resulted in a high level of patient adherence during the long-term treatment profile. Darifenazine is an another agent which has been approved by US FDA in 2004. It spares M1 and M2 receptors. It has a low incidence of dry mouth and constipation, no impairment of cardiac function, no significant effect on the cognitive function, and it has gotten comparatively a good CNS safety concern and adverse events withdrawal rates are similar to those associated with placebo. Darifenacin basically targets M3 receptors. It has got a nine fold greater affinity to M M3 compared to M1 and 59 fold greater affinity to M3 compared to M2. So darifenacin is used in the oral format. It is started with a dose of 7.4 milli milligram daily. And after a two weeks of the therapy, patient should be reassessed. And for greater symptom relief, dose may be enhanced to 15 milligram daily. Even in elderly patients who are above 65 years, starting dose is 7.5 milligram daily and reassessed after two weeks of therapy and who has got, and those patients who have acceptable toler tolerability, but require greater symptom relief, those can be enhanced without any problem to 15 milligram daily. So what one should do, one should balance, have a delicate balance of the anticholinergics based on the efficacy and adverse effect. It should be, the agent should be capable of uh, reducing the frequency, reducing the urge, urinary urge incontinence episodes and increasing the voided volume per maturation. At the same time, the adverse effects like dry mouth, constipation and CNS adverse events should be comparatively less. Mira background for overactive bladder, it's a novel first class B3 agonist used in the management of overactive bladder. It has got the Attained the, obtained the AF, US FDA approval in June 2012, whereas it has been used in Japan since 2011. What was the rationale of beta-3 agonism for overactive th bladder therapy? Limitations of other anti muscarinics prompted the research of novel pharmacological principles with a distinct mechanism of action and aimed to improve bladder storage phase symptoms without affecting the voiding phase and with a better tolerability profile. The clinical pharmacology of mirror background is it activates beta-3 receptor on bladder wall, as well as it inhibits efferent signals during the filling phase, thereby relaxing the detrusor muscle and increases the bladder storage capacity and ultimately resulting in reduction in maturation frequency, decreasing the incontinence episodes and increasing the voided volume per maturation. So it can be taken either with or without food it is metabolized by multiple pathways involving de dealkylization, oxidation, and amide hydrolysis. Half-life is 50 hours. It is 55% is excreted in the urine and 34% in the feces. So indications and dosage are, it is basically for treatment of overactive bladder. In those patients who have symptoms of urge urinary incontinence, urgency, and urinary frequency, and also in those who have, doesn't have significant relief with other anti cholinergics. The recommended dosage schedule should be started with a dose of 25 milligram orally per day with or without food. 25 milligram is effective within eight weeks period and based on individual efficacy and tolerability, those can also be increased to 50 milligram once daily. 
The major contraindications for the usage of mirabegron is those patients with end-stage renal disease and those who are having severe hepatic impairment. This is an article on the cardiovascular safety of beta creatinine receptor in the gullies. They are controlled that mirabegron appears to be having an acceptable cardiovascular safety and can be used freely without any concerns. These are the various adverse effects of Mirai background, but compared to other anticholinergics, these adverse effects are very minimal. So Mirai background has also been used in combination with other anticholinergics, that is efficacy of combination therapy of Mirai background and solifinacin. It has been found that this combination has been well tolerated over a period of 12 months, and the combination therapy has found to be more efficacious than either of them used individually. So it it's is a new compound with a novel mechanism of action in the treatment of OAB. It has proven effective across multiple randomized controlled trials, and it has got a favorable safety profile. It improves adherence of the patient to OAB treatment. It can be used in patients with contraindications to endemos clinics with a better safety profile. The effectiveness of Mirabegron has been confirmed in patients who had discontinued the previous endemos clinic therapy. My take home message is, Basically, the treatment of OAB, the first line is behavioral, which concentrates on dietary modification and exercise. Antimuscarinics are the first line in the, uh, of pharmacotherapy. Mira background can be given to patients unable to tolerate antimuscarinics. Combination of antimuscarinics and Mira background should be used in force with severe OAB, but those refractory cases should be offered other modalities like intravesical botulinum, sacral neuromodulation, cystoplasty, or urinary diversion. Thank you all for your patient mm -hmm. hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajib. Uh, thank you for highlighting the role of medication, or uh, the role of pharmacotherapy for the cases of overactive bladder. Now we have uh, 15 minutes time for the first session. So, I would like to request um, Professor Dr. Helmut Masserbasser for his expert comments. I will also request Dr. Madhu Agarwal for his expert comment. We have 10 more minutes for this session. So Professor Masserbasser, please. Thank you very much. I hope I can do it in the five minutes. Um, I think it was a pleasure to, to listen to these four lectures. And uh, we started with etiopathology, and I think it was really a good update of, of what, uh, what is our standing from etiopathology of OAB. It focused on the, especially on the afferent side. I think this is the most important point. And uh, however, we, we should not forget the micro emotions and the multifocal trigger points. But I think in, in, in general, I think it was a very complex and excellent lecture, which covered this uh, topic in a, in a very good way. We at the, then the, the second and third lectures, they had some overlaps. In regards to the lecture on clinical presentation of ORB, I just would say that instead of the term instability, you should use the term overactivity, which is now it is the, the term we are, we are using. And uh, uh, in regards to history, it was mentioned uh, very correctly that drug history <laughs> is, is, a very is, is very important. And especially when we have, uh, we have heard that uh, the ORB increases with age. In, in the aging population, they, in, at least in our areas, they take a, a variety, a number of, of, of medicaments at the same time. What I want to mention is that, especially, and I think also in your countries, for dementia, yeah. patients get cholinesterase inhibitors. It's very important to evaluate this because if a patient gets cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, his ORB symptoms, especially urgency and urgent continence, may increase and may be misinterpreted as a progression of the disease. In fact, it is a side effect of, 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 the, of the medication of, of given by the, by the neurologist. Uh, what I also said, um, 
uh, what I have written down here. Yeah, if we come to the to the thumb of, to the therapy, I think it's clear that uh, everybody now should start with behavioral therapy. But uh, this implicates that you have to talk to, to the patient, you have to explain him the physiology of the of, of bladder function and the and the pathophysiology. Only when he understands what is what is behind his symptoms then he will be able also to do good behavioral treatment. And uh, for the for pharmacotherapy, I think it will be, we heard an excellent overview what is given today. I think we have to, uh, again, we have to be careful where, when we treat eight, 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 uh, elder patients because uh, we have heard that they may have side effects also on the central function or on the cerebral function. And uh, therefore, you should always start in these people. Uh, first, you, you, should, you, should, you should consider the other medications he has. Secondly, if you decide for antimuscarinics, you should, if possible, choose an, 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 an antimuscarinic which does not pass the blood-brain barrier or which does, is not bound to the M3 uh, uh, M1 receptors in, in a high degree. Uh, maybe it is not in, in, this, in, in, your, in this area not very popular, but I men uh, we always uh, mention in, in, in this connection, in connection the drospium chloride, which has really certain advantages in this regard. In regards to beta three, uh, to, to beta three agonist, I think uh, we assume that they have no central side effects, but it's really not really proven. So we have to be also careful with, with these drugs in, in in the elderly people. And at, at the end, I would say that uh, I think we got a very good survey on etiopathology and uh, uh, how OAB presents how to evaluate and i think it was it, it was well done it was well said that uh, in first line even a neuroflow is not necessary according to guidelines although when you think that this patient will have will need a medication i think then i would do euroflow metry also in in the initial assessment because it's always good to know, because if you give antimuscarinics, you should know how effective uh, he, voids, he voids. So this, this is the only point I want to add. If you think in these patients that you could, uh, uh, that, that he, he is a candidate for therapy, then I would also include a uroflometry, if possible, in, in the first line uh, um, investigation. Otherwise, I think it was correctly said that uh, urodynamics and uh, other instrumentations, they are not for first-line treatment, but they have their special indications in the evaluation of ORB. Thank you very much. I had did a little, one minute more than five, but I hope you could tolerate it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Helmut. Now I request Dr. Madhu Agrawal, sir, to extend few of his expert comment over this subject. Thank you, uh, all speakers uh, who have done a great job, and Professor Helmut for your uh, expert comments. I think uh, Professor Helmut uh, is absolutely correct in highlighting the important points. Uh, I would like to say here that whenever we talk of overactive bladder, it's probably very important to separate the male and the female because the management, to my mind, differs to some extent in the evaluation also differs. When we get a female patient, very often these patients have been treated by a gynecologist empirically before they come to us. And to differentiate other causes uh, uh, for which cause similar urinary symptoms and to make the right diagnosis becomes very important in these patients. So in women, the differential diagnosis is completely different. Whereas in men, the differential diagnosis is completely different. And it becomes very important to, first of all, establish 
that this is actually a case of overactive bladder and not something else, not uh, stress incontinence or urinary tract infection like in women or not a case of bladder outflow obstruction as in uh, happens in men. So that I think is very important. And uh, about the treatment, uh, Dr. Helmut has very rightly pointed out the medication history is very important. And something as innocuous as a beta blocker can sometimes precipitate symptoms of overactive bladder. And beta blocker are so commonly prescribed for a variety of reasons by physicians. So somebody who's receiving beta blockers, one has to be careful uh, and we may have to actually ask the physician to either stop beta blockers or switch to selective or super selective beta blockers before you are trying to give this patient a beta agonist uh, on the other side. And uh, similarly, uh, when you are giving uh, anticholinergics, then one has to be careful about excluding outflow obstruction. And irrespective of the guideline, I think uh, uroflometry and residual check is probably absolutely necessary before you put these patients on anticholinergic therapy. Uh, in in our uh, in my personal experience and many of my colleagues I have realized are leaning more and more heavily upon uh, beta agonists for this simple reason that uh, the anticholinergic side effects are less and the patients who have concomitant obstructive pathology uh, respond better to the uh, beta agonists except that you have to be careful about hypertension in these patients. So I think uh, the subject has been covered very well by the speakers. And uh, we, we need to go to the second section, which I think is more interesting about the, the difficult uh, variety of OAP. So I think let's, let's carry forward. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Madhu, uh, sir. Uh, so we still have five more minutes mm -hmm. for this session. So would you like to take some a short question, sir. There was a few questions from the audience. So I think five minutes we'll discuss yeah. a few of the questions and then we'll move ahead. Okay. So the first question is to yeah. Dr. Islam. Uh, this question is from Aruf Zaman. Uh, so he asked uh, that what's the difference between OR's incontinence uh, and overactive bladder? Is it the same clinical condition or it's a different? Dr. Islam. Uh, Dr. Islam, are you with us? Please unmute your mic. Are you asking me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, what is the question, please? So, what's the difference between urgency, uh, urgency in continent and overactive bladder? Is this two condition the same? Okay, overactive bladder is a constellation of symptoms where urgency is the main part. It may be associated with urgence, urge incontinence, may not be. So incontinence associated with urgency is urge incontinence. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a valid answer. Yeah. yeah. And there's one question to Dr. Rajiv. Dr. Rajiv, are you there? Yes. 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 Uh, Can you repeat the thing? So there's a question from, yeah, it's a question from Dr. Mayas Adhikari. So in your clean, usual clinical practice, which agent is your first line of medical therapy and how long? So this is, I think, the very valid questions for all the practicing urologists. In the, in the females, I prefer to start with uh, solifinacin as common. Uh, uh, I usually is try first solifinacin before switching over to anything as the first line of therapy. And if you consider the males with overactive bladder, as uh, uh, Madhusar has highlighted, we have to rule out outflow obstruction. And uh, those who are having associated with pH, I always go to Mirabagron as the first line of the therapy. And only in Mirabagron, as I've been highlighted, we have to see about the antihypertensive. Uh, because some people may require a slightly higher dosage for giving the thing. But in these patients, we have to be cautious about the antihypertensive, especially whether they are uh, you put on uh, beta blockers. 
So this is how I categorize. But initially, after in the females, after giving polyphenacin, if after uh, around four to six weeks of therapy, if there is no significant uh, relief or they, they are not better with the drug, with the whatever diary they are maintaining, I switch on to Mira background. Uh, the next question is how long? So. How long before, before switching over? Yeah. I told you four to six weeks, I will try with solifinacin. If the patient is having some relief, but not significant relief, then I will enhance the dosage as I highlighted earlier. But still the patient after 12 weeks of therapy doesn't show any relief, then I will switch over. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Rajib will answer to this question. So uh, now we need to move on to our uh, next uh, session um, and I think we are going to have a more interesting presentation in this session and uh, first uh, presentation of the second session I would like to request Dr. Pawan Basudevan uh, for the over highlight the management of refractory OAB. So Dr. Pawan please. Mm -hmm. uh, so is my uh, screen visible? Not yet. I'd like to thank the Sakya Rology Association, uh, Dr. Madhu sir, uh, Dr. Pawan and Dr. Raji for this uh, opportunity. I will be speaking on uh, management of uh, refractory OED. So we will first look at. Uh, so we will first look at when should we call a patient refractory, and then look at the various therapies which are uh, uh, established in this in this field. So, so when you have a uh, Dr. Rajiv has already alluded to the uh, uh, to the medical therapy. So when should we call a patient uh, to be refractory? Should it be after one antimuscarinic? Should it be after a double dose of a single antimuscarinic? Should it be after two antimuscarinics? Should it be after an anti-muscarinic and uh, uh, and mirabegron? And what should be the duration for which these drugs uh, should have been tried before you label uh, uh, a patient as refractory? So there is there is no clear consensus in the uh, in the literature on what constitutes uh, refractory. But uh, the USI guidelines on the non-urogenic uh, incontinence in adults, which was published uh, last year. We, we put out a statement on what is refractory urge urinary incontinence, which is essentially uh, wet OAB. And uh, uh, we thought that somebody who does not get a satisfactory response to drug therapy, which is combination therapy of an anti-muscarinic and mirabegron, and also conservative management for 12 weeks, is somebody who should be, uh, is somebody who can be labeled as refractory. And one point we had introduced in this uh, definition is that a voiding diary should have been, uh, is, is must to have been examined before you label somebody as, as refractory. And uh, this uh, definition is crucial to understand because unless we are able to uh, say that this patient is refractory, the invasive therapies may not be uh, justified. So, so the reason why we introduced uh, voiding uh, diary is, uh, I'll just show an example. This was an elderly gentleman with uh, uh, who had a, who had the uh, frequency uh, uh, as the main complaint with some urgency, and when we looked at his voiding diary, he essentially was just drinking too much fluid. So Mira background did not help. Anti muscarinics did not help. He had been referred for uh, a Botox uh, injection, but the voiding diary solved the problem. He just had to take less uh, uh, less fluids. Now before we get on to the therapies in uh, refractory OAB. It is important that we understand that invasive urodynamics, the USI guidelines do recommend that invasive urodynamics should be done prior to embarking on invasive therapies, even though the evidence that it helps is not uh, uh, very robust. So if you look at uh, the therapies that are established, the first is uh, botulinum toxin. We all know that it's the ona botulinum toxin A, which is uh, uh, FDA approved and all the other variants are off label. The dose for idiopathic OAB is 100 units as the, the starting dose. 
the standard injection technique which was described in the pivotal studies of uh, Professor Chappell and Professor Nitti was that you dilute this to, to uh, 10 ml and then you inject 0.5 ml intradetrusor at 20 sites and you avoid the dry wound. There is, although there is no consensus whether how much should you dilute, how many uh, uh, sites you need to inject, or for that matter, you need to uh, uh, avoid the trigone, or can it, could it be involving, uh, could, could you also inject within the trigone? Now, uh, if the patient does not respond, or if the response is less than six months, you could consider uh, 200 units. This is different from uh, the neurogenic uh, uh, spinal uh, OAB or the spinal cord patients. At 200 is the standard dose. And uh, for uh, the cerebral uh, uh, DOs, the uh, standard dose is, uh, is, is 100. Now, the onset uh, botulinum toxin will start working within the first week. The urgency component is the most consistently and the most uh, rapid the, which, which responds. And if you look at this graph uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the study of uh, Professor Apple, most of the response has come by two weeks. And so, and then it uh, fairly stays stable for for about uh, till uh, 12 weeks. I mean, this is the period for which they, they, they saw it. So if you are to take your patient off an anti muscarinic by two weeks, the effect of Botox would have, would, would have come in. Now it improves all the parameters, I mean, all the uh, components of, uh, of overactive bladder. And uh, if you look at this graph, uh, around one in four patients would be 100% dry and about two in three patients would have less than, would have more than 50% benefit in their urge incontinence uh, uh, episodes. So you need to have realistic expectations and what that one in four will get, will get dry and about two in three will have more than 50% benefit. In this study, the, the uh, baseline urge urinary incontinence episodes was about five uh, in a day, which is, which is fairly severe OAB. Now, would it matter if the Botox is injected into a patient who has severe OAB or who's, uh, you know, he may have uh, uh, been uh, inadequately managed uh, with one anti muscarinic or two anti muscarinic? So, it has been found that it, uh, the improvement is regardless of the number of anticholinergics used or the reason for inadequate management. Uh, I mean, it would not matter whether you were injecting for intolerable side effects or for insufficient efficacy. How long does the effect last? The median time to retreat treatment request is about uh, 24 weeks. So one third would request before a six month period, about one third would be all right for a six to 12 month period. And another one third would, uh, their effect would last for, for more than uh, uh, 12 months. Repeated injections, they are, uh, they are known to be as efficacious as uh, the, the first one. And we have data for up to six uh, retreatment cycles. Side effects, uh, urinary tract infections, the most common 25% uh, incidence, but, uh, but they're almost always uncomplicated. So that's the good news. Uh, what about the need for intermittent catheterization? Now, this is an important thing to consider in the idiopathic OAB population because, most, because all of them are uh, you know, self-voiders. So if you, if you see uh, this um, graph, around 6 to 7% of patients will need uh, some form of intermittent catheterization after you've injected 100 units. Uh, about 2.5% or 40% of those patients who are initiated on CIC will be uh, off or you can wean them off CIC in about in less than six weeks. But another 40% of patients, which is about 2.5% of the overall population, will require CIC for more than 12 weeks. Now, um, uh, the novel delivery methods are being uh, uh, now developed for uh, abortivism toxin. And the rationale is that you don't want to go in with a cystoscope and inject. If you could just instill and uh, by some method increase the permeability of the bladder wall and the Botox could go through. So uh, that, that is uh, the rationale of these uh, in, in, uh, encapsulating it with a liposome or adding electromotive drug administration. So uh, these methods are being developed to avoid an in, uh, injection and so maybe make it less invasive by just instilling it via catheter. Coming to the next established uh, therapy, which is uh, sacral neuromodulation. Again, long-term efficacy data is robust and about 75% of the patients will have more than 50% benefit uh, in their urinary uh, incontinence. The problem with the um, sacral neuromodulation is more to do with the, the the side effects, you have a 22% uh, 
revision surgery um, um, at, at five years cumulative, and uh, then there are issues with implant site pain, therapeutic ineffectiveness, and uh, uh, the uh, it, you have under desirable changes in the in the stimulation. There are some uh, there the, some of the patients who require uh, surgery due to battery depletion. That portion is being now worked on. You're now having uh, batteries that can be can be recharged. Uh, so between uh, uh, botox, so between botulinum toxin and between uh, the uh, uh, sacral neuromodulation, which is superior, the answer is that so far there is no trial which has looked at the recommended dose of uh, botulinum toxin versus contemporary SNM time leads. The trial that was done was using 200 units of botox, in which it it was shown that botulinum toxin is superior to, uh, but but at the doses that are currently recommended, there is no head-to-head -head trial. The USI guidelines, uh, although uh, have recommended that uh, in our part of the world, uh, we may prefer botulinum toxin because of the issues of uh, cost, availability, and uh, and expertise. So this was the guideline statement, which said that uh, you could offer uh, either of these in patients with urgency urinary incontinence in whom drug therapy is ineffective, contraindicated, or not tolerated. Uh, will uh, sacral neuromodulation work in a patient who's failed Botox? The answer is yes. Will Botox work in a patient who's failed sacral neuromodulation? The answer is again yes. And have these two been looked at together? The answer is we do not have data on that so far. Now, uh, coming to the third uh, therapy which is uh, uh, established, which is percutaneous posterior tibial stimulation. Now, this is less invasive. Uh, it's a peripheral nerve approach which is less invasive. You need to have be you need to go through 12 weekly treatments of 30 minutes each, and then uh, possibly maintenance therapy after that. We have data uh, for about three years, and the success rate is is again close to 60% uh, without any major side effects. So the guidelines again recommended that it is effective for the short-term treatment of women with uh, urge urinary incontinence. There are two modifications which are coming in this zone. One is instead of having the the uh, the needle uh, to to stimulate the posterior tibial nerve. Now there are patch electrodes uh, which have come up, which is the transcutaneous posterior tibial nerve stimulation. There is not enough data on this as yet. And the other thing which has come up is uh, implanting uh, an electrode so the patient doesn't have to come back. So one of the reasons why this did not take off too well was because the patient had to come back uh, repeatedly for for twelve weeks. And this. Uh -huh. uh, uh, um, this implantable uh, uh, electrode aims to, to take care of that, that thing. Now, what is, uh, how do we choose the right therapy? Or, uh, what is the, the, the way forward? Now, so far, we are between botulinum toxin and sacral neuromodulation based on what, what we know, so as in what we are comfortable with, and also taking some patient preferences in, in, uh, in mind. But it's essentially what you can do. The future is going to be a little different because now OAB, they are looking at patient comorbidities and then deciding which therapy would be better. They're also trying to phenotype OAB. So uh, OAB is no longer considered considered to be a, a, a unifactorial, it's a multifactorial disease. They are trying to bring it down to different phenotypes. And once they're able to do that, then to develop, uh, then to decide which therapy would be better in which category. So, for example, if you look at patient comorbidities, if somebody has increased, uh, so for an elderly gentleman, male sex, high BMI, somebody who's frail, somebody who's had recurrent UTI, somebody who has a high PVRU or a low UFR, uh, botulinum toxin has shown to have inferior results or uh, uh, side or more side effects. So, in these patients, you may want to lean towards sacral neuromodulation. Also, if you look at the phenotypes, uh, there is something called as pelvic organ crosstalk. So somebody who has bowel issues, sexual issues, or chronic pelvic pain, this category again may benefit from uh, um, sacral neuromodulation. So we are looking at phenotyping of this multifactorial OAB, which will then give us uh, an individualized approach and the ability to uh, offer personalized uh, medicine to our patients. Now, what are the miscellaneous approaches within the electroceuticals or within the nerve stimulating uh, uh, Variety we have uh, we have saphenous nerve that has been uh, uh, neuromodulation done with that we've had pudendal nerve neuromodulation which has also been done laparoscopically so it's either image guided fluoroscopic or laparoscopic 
and also dorsogenital nerve, which could be needed in uh, transcutaneous. A new thing that has uh, been recently, uh, that has recently come up is selective bladder denervation. So via a cystoscope, they, with a temperature controlled radio frequency, they are uh, selectively denervating the trigonal area as a therapy for overactive bladder. One year results were published recently and they are, uh, they are fairly promising. Now for the very rare patient, uh, so this augmentation cystoplasty, while it could be more commoner in the neurogenic variety, but in the refractory OAB population, it is one of the last choices and you should only consider in the it in the extremely rare case where other therapies have been deemed unsuccessful or are not applicable. So to conclude, there is no universal consensus as yet on what constitutes refractory OAB. Botulinum toxin injection, sacral neuromodulation and percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation are therapies that are approved and established for refractory OAB. Phenotyping the refractory OAB is a work in progress towards personalized medicine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul, for a nice elaboration on this management of overactive bladder. Uh, now we have next presentation on BPS with overactive bladder, how to handle this situation, uh, because this both diseases coexist, and uh, at times it's very challenging to manage the condition. Uh, I'll request Dr. AKM Anwarul Islam to highlight on this issue. Islam, sir, please. Dr. Islam, your mic is mute. Kindly unmute your mic. Please unmute, sir. Unmute, sir. Unmute. At the left corner, sir. Unmute. Uh, Miss Aditi, will you help her? Help him to unmute? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Perfect, Dr. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry for the interruption. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Madhu Agarwal, the president of um, Park Association of Urological Surgeons and Dr. Pavan for inviting me in this forum. Um, my topic is BPH, uh, with OAB, how to handle it. The BPH and LUTS are highly prevalent in older men. Uh, the severity and prevalence of LUTS increases with age. The voiding subcategory of LUTS is most prevalent in BPH and the storage subcategory is very bothersome and is synonymous with OAB syndrome. I'd like to say something uh, about the natural history of BPH. There, is, um, uh, there may be static obstruction and dynamic obstruction. Static obstruction is offered by the bulk of the growth that is prostate, and uh, it is stroma and gland together. And dynamic obstruction is offered by the increased tension by of the smooth muscle in the prostate and blood and neck mediated by alpha, um, uh, alpha receptor. And at the same time, the stromal growth um, uh, leads to lay down of lot of smooth muscle 
and in normal prostate the stroma to epithelial ratio is 2 is to 1 and in clinical bph is 5 is to 1 so the smooth muscle has got a lot of uh, to do here the pathophysiology of bph the progressive increased urethral resistance and there is decreased flow bladder bladder compensation in energy and increased voiding pressure increased intravesical pressure at end filling so uh, pressure uh, it is not only voiding pressure but also filling pressure is also increasing gradually increased smooth muscle component of the detrusor and detrusor still can compensate and bladder dysfunction is there detrusor over activity is there but after some time the detrusor decompensates and the pvr rises and gradually patient develops into chronic retention and increased smooth muscle tension is a central role in LUTS, OAD, and erectile dysfunction. You can see the picture where the um, smooth muscle are in prostate, in bladder neck, in detrusor, and also in the um, uh, erectile tissue of the penis and the cavernous uh, arteries. These are all smooth muscle. This increased smooth muscle tension is the central role in all these things. And we have to address together. And therapeutic strategy, wavy symptoms are embarrassing and disrupting the daily life and more bothersome. In BPH with OAB, the treatment targeting prostate often fails to alleviate the OAB symptoms and seems inappropriate and sometimes inadequate. So OAB needs to be independently addressed. It is not only the prostate and bladder, sometimes the other causes may produce similar symptoms, non-BPH causes of obstruction, detrusor aging effect, neurogenic bladder, primary bladder diseases and polyuria. All these can and, uh, produce these type of symptoms which are frequently overlapping. The treatment options of BPH with OAB. The lifestyle modification, as our previous speakers has already mentioned about behavioral modification and lifestyle modification, and, and then medical therapy. But in BPH, there is another option, which is uh, watchful waiting. But once there is OAB, I think the bothersome symptom is so high, these uh, patients with BPH are not um, fit for suitable for watchful waiting. So we Lifestyle modification, we go to medical therapy and if necessary, surgical treatment. The lifestyle modification, we should uh, ask the patient to avoid food beverages that irritate the bladder and manage fluid intake. One of my previous speaker has mentioned that four liter or five liters in our my clinical practice, I have seen patient taking six, seven and even 10 liters of water and, and take, telling me that my flow is, my flow is diminished because it is the terminal part of the flow which is diminished and that he is, he is very much concerned. And the stop evening fluid to avoid the nocturia and avoid constipation also. Constipation in elderly sometimes is a cause of retention of urine as well. And exercise is very important. Medical therapy includes alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, anti mascarinics beta-3 adrenoreceptor agonists, and phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors and combination therapy. Combination may be in between alpha blockers, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, in between alpha blockers and anti mascarinics, anti mascarinics and beta 3 agonists together with alpha ag blockers, and, and maybe together with phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors when there is associated erectile dysfunction. Alpha blockers acts on the dynamic component of um, BPH. The obstruction is caused by increased smooth muscle tension present in the prostate and in the bladder neck. And this alpha blockers opens up the bladder neck, relaxes the prostate and eases the flow of urine and the back pressure that is high detrusor pressure, voiding pressure is lessened and patient gets relieved. And in about one third of the patient of uh, BPH with overactive bladder, uh, does not require, that is monotherapy may be enough for these type of patients. But rest of the patients 
may need some form of anti-masculinics or other drugs. Adverse effects are dizziness, postural hypotension, etc. There are several ultra, um, alpha blockers available uh, in uh, our market. The temsulosin, alfujosin, silodosin are uh, commonly used, and terajosin and doxajosin are also uh, used by some urologists. And those these two drugs require titration, but all are equally if if a case yes. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors acts on static component of BPH. It blocks the conversion of T to testosterone to dihydrosyl testosterone, which is the active form of the hormone acting on the target organ and uh, stimulates the prostatic tissue. It acts on the epithelium and results in reduction in the size of the prostate size, uh, approximately 20 to 30%. Efficacy depends on the gland size, more than 40 ml. It slows disease progression, relieves symptoms, reduces risk of acute urinary retention and BPH related surgery. There are two molecules, finasteride and deuterosteride, and they have got similar efficacy. Although their um, the receptor binding sites are uh, different, that is one, deuterosteride utilizes two sites and finasterides use single site. Anyway, the efficacy is similar. Their adverse effects are importance, libido decreased, ejaculatory volume decreased, breast enlargement, and hot flashes. And this type of decreased libido, hot flashes, etc., can be compensated to some extent by tenolafil, that is, phosphodiesterase 5 in 5 inhibitors. Targeting OAB, anti masculinics in men, um, our um, one of our previous speaker has mentioned about the use of um, anti-masculinics in, um, in bladder outlet obstruction. It, it, was a, it was a very much concern about the possible acute urinary retention. But there are studies where anti-masculinics in men with LUTS and bladder outlet does not elevate the risk of acute urinary retention. However, the PVR is significantly raised. OAB symptoms are relieved by inhibition of involuntary bladder contractions and increases the bladder capacity. Treatment can be limited by adverse effects such as dry mouth, constipation, and CNS side effects, which is very much important, especially in elderly patients where cognitive function is to be addressed very seriously. The mode of actions of OAB treatments, the, um, here we see the um, uh, anti-masculinics acting on the, uh, blocks the masculinic receptors. And here the beta-3 agonist stimulates the activates the uh, beta-3 adrenergic receptors. That it increases the relaxation. It is a sort of active, active relaxation, rather to say, in the feeling phase. Uh, and masculinic, um, masculinic receptors are distributed throughout the whole body, and it has got side effects. Uh, it has, this slide has already been shown by Dr. Rajiv. And, now the beta-3 adrenoceptor agonist, Mirabegron, its efficacy, safety, and tolerability, significant effect in 60% of patients over placebo, and dry rate in 42% in case of incontinence. Equal efficacy in naive and anti-masculinic resi resistant patient, and side effects at placebo level. So it is a very, very uh, interesting drug, and the studies uh -huh. The, there are a lot of studies regarding uh, anti-masculinics uh, in OAB, but as the Mira background has, um, um, has come in the market very recently, the, um, even then there are a lot of studies which has um, uh, shown the equal efficacy as uh, like anti-masculinics, but there are a lot of reduced side effects. That is the interesting thing. Anti-masculinic versus beta-3 agonist, modulate bladder function through different molecular pathways. In clinical practice, anti-masculinics are often initially prescribed and efficacy is similar in both drug classes, but combination provides additive effect and minimizes side effect. These two can be um, uh, um, combination therapy can be, solifenacin and mirabegron can be um, combined together. Rationale of combination therapy in BPH with OAB. Each of static and dynamic components of BPH is an independent target of pharmacotherapy. 
both prostate and bladder can be targeted by combined therapy drugs acting in different phases of menstruation cycle utilizing different receptors can provide additive effects and dose of drugs having an ad adverse effect can be reduced by taking another drug in combination with less side effects and phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors decreases the smooth muscle tone like alpha blocker it acts like alpha blocker and it improve erectile function and many of these elderly males have erectile dysfunction so it may be useful and good combination treatment and side effects include back muscle ache gastroesophageal reflux disease and headache now in summary the medical treatment of bph is persistent bothersome luts the mixed bladder outlet obstruction with oab here the alpha blocker and antimuscarinics or beta 3 agonist or both and in case of if this bladder outlet obstruction is associated with large prostate the alpha blocker may be combined with five alpha reductase inhibitors so a, a combination can give a good um, relief to the patient and medical therapy prominent bladder outlet obstruction if the prostate gland is small alpha blocker may be enough if large gland alpha blocker plus five alpha reductase inhibitors and mixed bladder outlet obstruction with erectile dysfunction pd5 inhibitors with or without alpha blocker there are some conditions where there is nocturnal polyuria and nocturnal anuresis the we may prescribe the desmopressin there or there are some oral uh, dispersible tablets and which is very much useful in reducing the uh, nocturnal polyuria and frequency but in elderly population with impaired renal function or cardiac function this drug should be carefully prescribed and another drug is imipramine which is central depressant and may cause drowsiness similar side effect profile of antimuscarinic uh, medication but this imipramine it is better to be avoided in case of bph with um, uh, oab because it it uh, may it may uh, tightens the bladder neck instead of uh, uh, relaxing now the surgical treatment if the bothersome luts indications are bothersome luts refractory medical treatment this surgical treatment is not for the uh, bladder but for the prostate uh, um, because my previous speaker has mentioned about the uh, augmentation of the bladder if the uh, other modalities fails the refractory urinary retention the recurrent uti recurrent uh, the bladder outlet obstruction with recurrent uti recurrent hematuria renal insufficiency due to chronic bladder outlet obstruction vesical calculus diverticulitis etc procedures are minimally invasive procedures that can be taken into consideration and conventional surgery also may be considered prior optimal evaluation of the and counseling is very very important because of the possibility of the subsequent persistence of the urg urinary incontinence may be there however the obstruction should be relieved to prevent the renal deterioration and after the relief of obstruction the bladder can be um, controlled by higher doses of antimuscarinics or mira begrom in summary the treatment of bph and oaba is slowly evolving emphasis on both voiding and storage symptoms is to be um, given as per their own merit antimuscarinic therapy alone or with alpha blocker improves oab symptoms in men with or without bladder outlet obstruction antimuscarinics in men with luts and bladder outlet obstruction does not elevate the risk of risk of urinary retention and beta 3 agonist is also useful in male luts with oab thank you very much for patient hearing uh, thank you dr islam for nice elaborating the coexisting conditions in a elderly population it's always uh, better to evaluate the patient and uh, take a proper decision so once you had a qrp done for these con conditions when the patient has a overactive bladder detrusor instability how to proceed with that situation so now i'll request professor helmut to take this topic post qrp detrusor instability 
dilemmas and solution dr helmut please yes dear colleagues and friends well the first 15 seconds are greetings from innsbruck the town of where, where i live and work you see this is the hospital complex part of the hospital complex and behind you see all the mountains a few hundred meters airline distance away this is the main complex of our university hospital and I am sitting here in, in this building in the second floor in the library of the Department of Urology for my lecture post-TR, post-TRP overactive bladder dilemmas and solutions. A really challenging topic and it's a pressure and, a, and an honor for me to, to present this, this lecture now. Well, I think uh, when, when evaluating ORB symptoms after BPO surgery, it is important to adhere to appropriate terminology or classification. Early postoperative uh, storage symptoms uh, are something different than from overactive bladder after TURP. These early postoperative storage symptoms, often new in onset, summarized as dysuria, are normally associated with postoperative wound healing, inflammation, and pain. They are usually of short term less than three months. However, if they persist, and if inflamed prostate or residual tissue might be the reason, then these patients need a re-TURP. Now let's come to, um, um, to the topic. We do a de-obstruction in our patients, and most of them have also some uh, degree of ORB or DO. And we know that if we do a deobstruction, only about 50% have, have no ORB afterwards, and in 50% it may persist. The possible reasons are different. So this is a, a distinct group, but it's heterogeneous. First, another one reason could be that the ORB the patient has has nothing to do, is unrelated to, to PBO. We know that male LUTs have traditionally been related to bladder outlet obstruction caused by benign prostatic enlargement. But increasing evidence nowadays relates LUTs to bladder dysfunction, such as the tuser overactivity or overactive bladder symptoms. And you are well aware that uh, uh, symptoms, um, ORB symptoms, are as prevalent in men as in women and increase with age. Here you see two studies, the SIFO study and the EPIC study from 2005. It, show, it shows the, 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 the prevalence of ORB, sorry, the prevalence of ORB on the left side and on the horizontal, the age groups. And, and you see that in both studies, the, uh, the, 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 the the prevalence of ORB in male and uh, females are the same in, in the SIFO group. It's in yellow. You see the straight line are the men. The dotted line is the women. And the same is, is in, in the APIC study. So these curves run parallel. So it's, it's very likely that the patient can have a BPO on one side and unrelated to this uh, uh, symptoms of the overactive bladder. So this is an entity of its own, and you have to recognize this. So this is the situation. We have one side, PBA and PBO, and unrelated a detrusor overactivity uh, leading to ORB symptoms. So what are the reasons for, for, this, for, for, for the ORB symptoms in this group of patients, mainly as uh, a mainly aged man? And they are mostly due to a defect of, ner of the defect of the nervous con control mechanism, what we call cerebral ORB. If you take the history, you may find a distinct discrepancy in the time of onset of ORB and the onset of PPO. There may be very different uh, uh, time onsets. You also have to look for concomitant risk factors who makes also this condition more likely. This is metabolic syndrome and diabetes mellitus. And the therapy 
in, in, in this type of overactive bladder after TURP, mostly other these patients have some, some problems with ORP or already preoperatively, are of course lifestyle interventions as we've already heard, pharmacotherapy, antimuscarinous beta-3 agonists, and especially if urge incontinence is predominant, botulinum toxin A may be the, the, the therapy of choice. With all of them, with a minimal risk for urinary retention after you have the uh, after the obstruction. Well, and the second and the, the, the other group is uh, that uh, EU uh, ORB postoperatively is caused by the trousseau changes induced by PPO. Despite the obstruction, these these changes may persist and may be only partially or not reversible. How often do we see ORP symptoms after, after TURP? Well, I show you who, two, two studies. Uh, in one study, 46 patients undergoing TURP, DO, the intrusive overactivity was present in 26, 56% in men preoperatively. Of these 26 men having DO, uh, only in 62%, in this is 16 patients, they had the, 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 there was a resolution of DO, while 10, that's 80, 83, uh, 38%, were suffering from DO at 12 months postoperatively. And postoperatively, uh, postoperatively, DO did not develop in any patient who have not had a DO preoperatively. Another study is a, a prospective study of 165 patients undergoing HOLAP symptom, a HOLAP. Symptoms and urinamic parameters were analyzed prior to and six months after HOLAP. The rate of patients with DO decreased from 45%, 74 patients preoperatively, to 36 patients, so 36%, 59 patients. So you see there's a significant number of, of, of patients which, which suffer ORB symptoms after TURP, but mostly they had this, this problem uh, also before the operation. Maybe the symptoms of avoiding the dysfunction was uh, more important for them at, at that time. So persisting ORB. So we have this situation. Uh, really, BPO induced changes in the of function, as we will hear in a moment, which causes DO and then the ORB symptoms. It was already Werner Schaefer years ago who could show that the more severe the obstruction is, the higher it is the rate of the trusor overactivity. So there is a correlation between severeness of obstruction and ORB activity uh, and the trusor overactivity. Now the question is how might PBO lead to bladder dysfunction? Is there a structural, histological, or biochemical background? I, I would like to refer uh, to, to a very nice paper uh, published in Neurology and Neuronomics. Do functional changes occur in bladder due to bladder outlet obstruction? This was the topic. Uh, of during one of the topics during the ICI RRS uh, research, ICI research in 2018, headed by the group was headed by, by, by Ruth Bosch and also one of our board members, Marshall Averbeck, was a member. And they 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 found the they stressed the following findings: BBO leads to structural to, to structural oxidative stress in the bladder ball. Initial inflammatory response and ischemia, and they result in progression to smooth muscle hypertrophy and increased collagen. Well, bladder and, and the choose of what, what, what thickness uh, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a parameter which is important. Several studies show the significant difference in bladder wall thickness between obstructed and non obstructed patients. And bladder wall elastography might be useful to assess the collagen content of the bladder wall non invasively, and thus might serve as a proxy for the choose of muscle contractility. On the other side, also neurotrophins may play a role in the, the choose of pathophysiology. Uh, the, the urinary nerve growth, the nerve growth factor, NGF, 
was associated with preoperative as well as postoperative OOP symptoms. In addition, various other mechanisms, such as ischemic induced variations in response to neurotransmitter of the urethelium and tetrusa muscle, nitric oxide pathways, and, and, and others may play a role. So there is a structural background, there is also a biological background. So the, the authors of this article hypothesize a three-stage three model to characterize BOO-induced bladder remodeling in humans. First, the first stage, muscle, smooth muscle hypertrophy and, and increased collagen. St stage two, uh, st uh, uh, compensation, increased detrusor contractility during the voiding phase, often in combination with filling phase detrusor activity, followed then by phase three, which may be then at eventually decompensation. They also have, have drawn a, a nice uh, um, uh, table here. And what I want to stress is, uh, what I want to take your, your attention is here. Where is it down here? They also, they, this, they, they put, they raise the question whether during the compensation phase, when you do the deobstruction, is a, a, a recovery of the, of the detrusor, or maybe even to normal possible. We know that once you have the detrusor under activity in the decompensation phase, then it's very unrealistic to believe that you have uh, an important recovery. From the data known, it seems that the bladder starts to compensate for increased outflow resistance as soon as the bladder is exposed to the obstruction. The compensation phase can last for several years, but thereafter the adaptive response declines. Eventually, contractile function of the bladder declines, and finally, the bladder decompensates. And Thomas stated uh, uh, 15 years ago, he could not demonstrate any long-term symptomatic or urinamic gains from TURP in men with both PBO and the juice or under activity. I would not agree completely to, to this statement, but I think there is some truth in it. Well, are there, are there risk factors behind persisting ORP symptoms after TURP? Well, several studies identify as preoperative risk factors a maximum systematic bladder capacity lower than 250 cc preoperatively associated with persisting DO in 64% in patients with, with, a, with, a, with a MMC below 250, but only in 20% of men with a, with a with a um, MMC of more than 250 cc. Then also the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the DO amplitude may be a risk factor. Prevalence of DO amplitude of more than 40 centimeters of water and early appearance of, of the DO um, is, a, is a bad sign and uh, is prone to persisting DO. And the preoperative, uh, the preoperative degree of storage symptoms on the IPS, small bladder capacity impaired to the control and age, were also associated with persisting ORB symptoms. Uh, the recovery, is recovery possible? Well, a very small but statistically significant reduction in, in the truth of what thickness one month after surgery was found. Patients with larger prostates and a high degree of obstruction showed the greatest reduction. Alpha blockers have been shown to significantly reduce blood water thickness in various studies. And after 24 weeks of treatment, a significant reduction of the truth of water thickness were observed. But these are very small studies and they need, we need much more uh, um, um, evaluation in this field. So the, 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 the treatment strategies, um, a prospective randomized compa uh, trial comparing the effect of tamsulcine with the combination of tamsulcine and solifenacine and no additional medication of TRP did not show additional lots improvement during a six weeks follow up. Another prospective randomized trial uh, uh, led to a significant reduction of storage uh, of storage lots, and the pre-surgical use of antimuscarinics is associated with the highest risk of continuing medic medication follow-up. So the evidence for all this is very poor, and we really we need more and better studies. So in summary, persistence of ORB symptoms after TURP is a common clinical scenario. Persisting ORB can be either unrelated to PBO, 
and this is an important point, or can be caused by BBO induced diffusive dysfunction, which may be unreversible despite the obstruction. A thorough clinical assessment, as well as urinary studies in selective cases, are cornerstones established the causes of persisting OLP. Treatment strategies depend on the underlying pathophysiology, we have already heard, lifestyle interventions, pharmacotherapy, pelvic floor muscle exercise alone or in combination with medication may be of benefit. Considering the lack of high-level evidence, a patient-centered and symptom-focused approach is crucial for the management of persisting OLP symptoms. And I think further, you have seen already, further studies are necessary to provide high-level evidence on the best treatment approach to improve quality of life in this heavily burdened group of patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Elmut, for a nice elaboration of this condition after TURP and how to manage those conditions. So we are running short of time. Uh, so uh, our next uh, presenter is Professor Chris Chappell, but because of some unavoidable uh, situation, he, he could not join us. Um, with his uh, live presentation, but uh, we are very thankful to him because he have sent us uh, his recorded video and uh, we are going to uh, share his uh, video shortly. Uh, so I'm going to share his uh, video and uh, this is the video uh, recorded video version from uh, Professor Chris Chappell. Dear colleagues. I'm sorry that I can't join you live at the uh, meeting Is today. it audible to everyone? But unfortunately, I had fairly short notice. Yeah, yeah, already. please. Total commitments. What I've been asked to address is the underactive bladder. Is it a reality or modern day hype? And in this context, what I thought I would do is to start from basic science through to clinical aspects. I have disclosures, because clearly I've worked in this area for many years. The first thing to bear in mind is that the bladder is an unreliable witness. Lower urinary tract symptoms are not disease specific. And in this context, therefore making a diagnosis based on symptoms is certainly very difficult. If one looks at the pathophysiology of lonely tract symptoms, clearly one has detrusive overactivity, reduced contractility and underactivity, and blood outlet obstruction. If one thinks about the etiopathogenesis of these different types of lonely tract symptoms, the underlying cause, in fact, then of course there could be a neurogenic cause, vascular, degenerative, neuropathic, peripheral neuropathy, spinal cord injury, pelvic fracture. Of course, in many cases, we don't know the cause. Can't, can't hear anything. Dr. Pan, there is no sound. Aditi, can you check this? Uh, His voice no. is gone. Can you please unmute yourself. For the sound. His, His sound is gone. Can you check? I think, Dr. Pawn, you need to unmute yourself. It could be a muscular dysfunction. Now we can hear. Impaired that. integration or processing, impaired activation of the trusor, early termination of the voiding reflex and loss of intrinsic contractility, or contributing to the trusor underactivity. And underlying this, of course, if one puts all this together, there could be the disease processes. And if one looks at the terminology used for the underactive bladder, going across the whole field, you can see that a number of terms have been used. Detrusor underactivity is a term that's been recommended by the ICS, 
based on neurodynamics. And could it be that underactive bladder as a condition could be to detrusor underactivity what the overactive bladder symptom complex is to detrusor overactivity? And bear in mind that in patients with detrusor overactivity, you see that overactive bladder is more prominent. So in other words, of the patients with overactive bladder, you can see only 40% of dry women, for instance, have detrusor overactivity, and only 60% of women with overactive bladder wet have to choose overactivity. So, and so if you look at this, there could be this overlap between the symptom diagnosis and the urodynamic diagnosis. Of course, if you've got the truth of underactivity, it's avoiding dysfunction, weak flow, intermittency, hesitancy, and straining. But if you've got a large residual, there will be storage symptoms in many cases. And of course, particularly with large residuals, there may be uh, leakage and there may be post voiding disruption. So clearly one's looking at a spectrum of symptoms associated with detrusor underactivity, with both voiding and storage symptoms. With this in mind, we set up a working party, and in this working party, we came up with a definition that underactive bladder is characterized by a slow urinary stream, by hesitancy, and draining the void with or without a feeling of incomplete bladder emptying and dribbling, often with storage symptoms. And this has been published and accepted as a draft document by the ICS. If one looks at predicted models of detrusor underactivity, you can see here that this interesting work developed a predictive model of detrusor underactivity in male patients. But like all these things, it's hypothetical. You can see they looked at a large number of patients and they looked at uh, a number of aspects of the patient's history. You can see their benign prosthetic hyperplasia, neurogenic disease, and so on. And they came up with the data that you see here and a suggestion that you could look at a model uh, based on the prediction of, of potential patients. So if one looks at what the definition of normal is from the ICS, normal voiding is achieved by a voluntary initiated continuous to true the contraction leads to complete bladder emptying within a normal time span and in the absence of obstruction. For a given to true the contraction, the magnitude of the recorded pressure rise will depend on the degree of outlet resistance. That's very clear, isn't it? So if one looks at a urodynamic trace, you can see here that there's a reduced to true the a contraction, good subtraction, as you can see. Remember, in urodynamics, this needs to be checked regularly every minute or so, and you can see here a low flow. So, low pressure, low flow. Okay, that's straightforward. Reduce strength, bladder emptying within a normal time, possibly, but very low flow. But we don't know the contraction strength, the duration of contraction, and the bladder emptying time. A more barn door situation here is a patient where there's really no detrusor contraction to speak of, and a very low flow no flow in this case. And of course, the problem is this could be a bashful voider, somebody who's very embarrassed and can't void in public. And is it therapeutically relevant to differentiate between the two types? Let's go to the work of Derek Griffiths. Now, Derek Griffiths is the father of urodynamics. He worked initially with Colonel Warwick and others when urodynamics was first defined from the Middlesex Hospital in 1969. And the whole basis of the voiding phase of urodynamics is the detrusor pressure flow hysteresis loop, which leads on to the normogram I'm sure you're familiar with, obstruction, high pressure, low flow, normality, high flow, low pressure, and of course, the equivocal group characteristic of underactivity, which is low pressure, uh, low flow, or low pressure, no flow, as I showed you. Now, underlying all this, of course, is the concept of the patient's uh, pressure that they're able to generate in their bladder. And in this context, there's a very complex calculation for the Watts factor with const constants that can be used. And the advantage of this concept is it's minimally dependent on volume. But of course, it's a complex calculation and there are no validated cutoffs. What is normality? 
nevertheless, using that calculation, you can apply this to the same algorithm I showed earlier with the equivocal or low pressure group shown there. Another approach which has been looked at is to look at the projected isovolumetric pressure and its derivative, the TRUSA coefficient, and the bladder contractility index. It's a simplified method of estimating the isometric contraction, rather dissimilar, sorry, rather similar to what Schaefer suggested. So you look at a point marking the protrusor pressure at maximum flow. You can extrapolate that down to the isovolumetric pressure during a stop test. And this can be calculated using this formula, uh, which we've already uh, considered. And certainly, if you then use this approach, you can see that you've got different degrees of contractility. It's simple to use, the measurement's easy to obtain, and it's an estimate of the isovolumetric contraction, but it may not be applicable to all patients, of course, men with post prospect being continent, where there's a relatively weak outlet, or where there's, and there's a poorer test-retest reliability than stop test alone. Nevertheless, these are the uh, calculations which have led on to the suggestion that a weak flow is less. How about ultrasound? Concept was to look at bladder wall thickness, but you can see that you're talking about uh, variants which are just millimeters and very observer dependent and volume dependent in the bladder. So really, I don't think, although interesting work has been carried out, this is going to be particularly useful in clinical practice. Another approach is to use an occlusion test, squeeze the penis during voiding, which is equivalent to the stop test. And of course, it allows you to measure pressure, but although it's a real-time indication of isovolumetric strength, and there's good test-retest reliability, and there are no calculations involved, the limitations are it's impractical and painful and possible in some patients. It can underestimate the contraction strength, and you need to repeat avoiding phase because, of course, you can't have a continuous occlusion. A lot of literature is accrued. You can see, uh, looking at the prevalence over here on the, on the right. And just to pull, pull all this together, here's a suggestion looking at the literature. The trues are under activity, probably affects between 9 and 28% of men under the age of 50 and 48% of those over 70. So clearly an age-dependent relationship, but it's not uncommon even in younger patients. And in women, it's found in between 12 and 45 percent of women undergoing urodynamic tests, and it's more prevalent amongst the institutionalized elderly. So if one comes on to treatment of under activity, of course, the mainstay is intermittent self catheterization You can uh, just watch patients, uh, and of course, other aspects which I'll come on to, such as sacral neuromodulation. So, if you're intervening, then of course you can consider bladder relevant issues, outlet related issues, and of course circumvented with catheterization. If you're looking at affecting the bladder, then of course straining may be useful. Reflex contractions if patients have a neurological disease process. Pharmacological therapy, there isn't any effective therapy present, and electrical stimulation has been suggested. And of course, uh, cystoplasty, uh, reduction cystoplasty has been used in the past, particularly for large diverticular, but not really proven to be effective. If the muscle's weak, you'll just produce a smaller reservoir, which is still weak. I'll come on to myoplasty. Outlet reduction, of course, if you look at uh, relaxing outlet uh, using the various approaches, pharmacological, etc., which we're all familiar with, and surgery. And if you've got a sink to muscle, which is problematical, you can consider various approaches, medical and surgical, but as we all know, difficult. And in the neuropath, then clearly surgery and consideration of an artificial sphincter is appropriate. The level of the striated sphincter, again, very difficult to manage, as I've already mentioned. So if one's thinking of conservative management, if there's pelvic floor spasm, behavioral intervention, uh, and of course, straining, double voiding, physiotherapy can be helpful, of course, 
and of course catheterization. Monitoring, you can see this interesting study from the UK looking at men with presumed detrusor underactivity on urodynamics, followed by watchful waiting with large residuals. And here you can see that these men uh, opted for watchful waiting, followed up by pelvic floor uh, image, pelvic floor, um, um, sorry, pressure flow studies uh, with a mean follow-up of 13.6 years. The message is just because you have a large residual, you don't have to rush into anything here. Remember, what we're talking about is avoiding efficiency. It's taken that avoiding efficiency of 40% is a tipping point. What you want is avoiding efficiency less than 40%. In other words, that you have the larger the residual, the higher the number, you want a lower residual. Residuals clearly can be a problem with the urinary infections and so on. One has to consider biochemical uh, fall-off of patients, check the upper tract regularly, particularly in neuropaths, uh, and of course, with bladder wall thickness, I think it's not going to be particularly useful. Catheterization, I don't need to, to emphasize, we're all familiar with the advantage of a superior catheter over a urethral. What about pharmacotherapy? Well, of course you can use pharmacotherapy looking at the outlet to relax it. People have looked at trying to use pharmacotherapy to stimulate the bladder, but none of these treatments have worked. And in fact, it's been suggested you shouldn't use cholinergic agonists because of the complications and side effects. To reduce outlet resistance, I've already mentioned alpha blockers, and of course you can use other approaches. Botulinum toxin, really, if you look at the original data, only lasts for 30 to 40 days, and nobody really knows what dose to use. They're not really recommended. So, if one's looking at pharmacotherapy, as I mentioned, cholinergic agonists don't work. A recent assessment of the world literature showed that there is nothing looking at all of the approaches, non-cholinergic approaches, and so on. There are, is a drug currently in assessment for development, but time will tell. Electrical stimulation on the bladder. In children, there's been some positive results, but really, if you look at it, they're not necessarily sustained, and maybe children are a sli slightly different group where there may be behavioral factors. In adults, there is no good evidence that it's effective, although it's been looked at. Of course, electrical stimulation at the level of the spinal cord, as Brindy showed, can be helpful, but that's a separate group with, of course, cutting the sensory feedback. So what about sacral neuromodulation? Well, there's been interesting work. This is from uh, from the Netherlands, from uh, Maastricht, where they looked at, but ultimately, it only works if there is residual detrusor contraction. It's not going to work for the very poorly contracted bladder or the patient who's got a so-called A-contractile bladder. What about other forms of surgical intervention? I've already mentioned surgery to the outlet, the problems with detrusor toxin, injection, reduction cystoplasty, which I don't feel is an effective approach. People have talked about stem cells, tissue uh, engineering, but really at the moment, it's still pie in the sky. The paper that came out from uh, the States, uh, from the group in Winston-Salem, really didn't show that tissue engineering of the bladder was effective. It was just a patch. Stem cells been postulated but really, how do you get them linked up with the brain so they work? Hypothetical at this stage. What about neural reconstruction or myoplasty? Let's look at that. There was work from China suggesting you could put in nerve grafts, but to be perfectly honest, the data was found to not necessarily be valid. And so that is still at the questionable stage. There's been a lot of work that Arne Stenzel first led when he was working with George Barch which was looking at Petrusa myoplasty. And they came up with an interesting multi-center study involving Professor Rainer in the States, in Mumbai, and they came up with a nice publication, which was looking at, uh, you can see here, a small number of patients. And you can see that these patients did relatively well, but they were very carefully selected. And that is the message, younger, carefully selected patients 
who can undergo an eight-hour operation with three surgical teams. They're probably not appropriate for the majority of patients. So I'll leave you with the message I started with, going back to my old mentor, the father of Eurotonomy. The bladder is an unreliable witness, and this applies to underactivity and overactivity. Remember, the target for everything is a sensory innovation, even for anticholinergics. It's just a downside that they act on the detrusor contraction, just like Botox. They act on urgency. If we're looking at detrusor underactivity, there's no good pharmacological agent present, as we've discussed. So the bladder, symptoms are not disease-specific. The patient, all patients report symptoms in different ways, and we're not blameless. We have our own biases, knowledge, interpretation when it comes to it. Thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity to speak and all the best for your meeting, which I'm sure will be very successful. And I look forward in the future to meeting up with you in person once again, once this terrible crisis is over. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, we are very thankful to Professor Chris Chappell to send this beautifully elaborated video. So we are running uh, behind our schedule time. So I'll request Dr. Sanjay Sinha to just to give few a short uh, expert comments and uh, we'll like to take one or two questions among from the audience and then we'll move on to another session. Dr. Sanjay, please. Thank you, Dr. Pawan. Good evening to everybody. Uh, so there were four excellent presentations over the last one hour and I'll make a very few comments regarding each of these presentations one at a time. Now, the first presentation was by Dr. Pavan Vasudeva on refractory overactive bladder. And um, I think it's important for us to recognize that in patients who are getting labeled as refractory, we need to ensure that we are not missing an alternate diagnosis. Now, this is something that Dr. Pavan mentioned about in his presentation. And as you look at the refractory population, a small but definite proportion of these patients will ultimately turn out to have diagnoses such as Parkinsonism or, or let's say some forms of subtle neurogenic dysfunction and so on. Uh, so it's important not to miss an alternate diagnosis. The other is that bladder pain syndrome and overactive bladder are probably a continuum of afferent abnormalities of the bladder. So it's probable that at one end of the spectrum, you have an overactive bladder. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the bladder pain syndrome and you have various uh, combinations of this, which may be presenting in the same patient. So it's important to recognize bladder pain syndrome may also be masquerading as an overactive bladder. The second presentation by Dr. Islam, again, a very good presentation on overactive bladder and BPH. All that I would like to add uh, there is that although uh, BPH predominantly produces voiding difficulty or a slow stream, the symptom that actually brings the patient to the doctor is almost invariably the storage symptom. It's the overactive bladder symptom that actually brings the patient to the urologist. And it's important to recognize this. Uh, it's also important to identify that in some patients, these overactive bladder symptoms might be an independent pathology. And in some patients, it might be consequent to the obstruction. We don't have good ways to differentiate this, but we do know that just because it's a male gender patient and that the patient has a prostate, it's not essential that we should be using an alpha adrenergic antagonist along with all the other therapies that we use. So for patients who have got storage predominant symptoms, you can manage these patients without the use of an alpha blocker. And this is something we'll discuss subsequently in our case presentations also. The third presentation, again, a, a wonderful presentation. I always enjoy listening to Professor Helmut Madersbacher. Uh, he's a mentor for all of us, uh, was on post-TURP uh, storage symptoms. And uh, here again, we unfortunately do not have a good method of prognosticating which patients are going to develop post-TURP storage symptoms. Uh, what is important is that, uh, uh, that we must be able to differentiate whether the patient is actually presenting uh, uh, with a complication of the TURP, which is presenting as an overactive bladder. So it's not uncommon once in a while, for instance, a post-TURP stricture to masquerade as an overactive bladder. Important to identify that you're not missing a complication. Uh, 
again, patients may have subtle uh, stress incontinence, post-TRP, uh, uh, post-prostatectomy incontinence, and patients may go more often to the bathroom to kind of uh, avoid a leak. And so it may again masquerade as an overactive bladder. Uh, a preoperative detrusor overactivity is not a good predictor. So there's a recent publication by Kim 2019, a systematic review, which showed that preoperative detrusor overactivity doesn't very well predict postoperative uh, uh, storage symptoms. But unfortunately, there, all detrusor overactivity, uh, it, was, it was counted as either present or absent. So there was, there was no yardstick to judge the severity of the detrusor activity. And it's quite possible that if you were to stratify patients by the, the severity of the preoperative detrusor activity, you might actually find that some patients actually are more prone to postoperative symptoms. Finally, the last presentation by Professor Chris Chappell on underactive bladder. This is a subject which exercises some amount of uh, insight, some amount of controversy. And I personally have a distaste for this particular syndrome. The simple reason is that when you look at overactive bladder, which is also a syndromic diagnosis, you have a good clinical method of differentiating where the cause lies. So you know you have storage, you have voiding. And this, both of these can be either because of the bladder or because of the outlet. When you're looking at overactive bladder, by good clinical uh, evaluation of the patient, you can by and large differentiate whether the patient has a voiding problem and whether the storage problem is because of the bladder or because of the outlet. In contrast with underactive bladder, you do not have a good method to differentiate whether the patient's symptoms are because of the bladder or because of the outlet. And here, when you give a label to the patient as an underactive bladder, my concern is that a patient who has a potentially treatable problem will get labeled as underactive bladder and will not get a definitive therapy which might have improved the patient. Now, there are patients who may be presenting a 200 ml, even 300 ml of residual urine. And you have seen these patients in your practice. A male patient has prostatomegaly, or may not have prostatomegaly for that matter, but has bladder outlet obstruction but has 300 ml of residual and you do a TURP and the patient completely resolves. So giving a label of an underactive bladder without a urodynamics doesn't really help in managing the patient. That's my personal feeling. And if you are going to do a urodynamics, why do you need a separate syndromic diagnosis of underactive bladder? So I have certain concerns regarding this label because I feel some patients will get, will get denied potentially therapeutic uh, treatments which could actually improve their condition. So with these brief comments, I thank you all very much for asking me to give expert comments. These are four very interesting presentations. Thank you, Dr. Pavan, for asking me to give comments on them. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for such a nice and elaborative comments over the um, World Authority's presentation. Uh, I think now we are running really uh, short of time. We are behind the schedule by about 30 minutes. So I think it's, um, we need to switch on to our third session, which is case-based discussion. So I again request Dr. Sanjay Sinha to take over this forum and uh, start the third sessions. And I will also request our panelist, Dr. Helmut, uh, Dr. Rizwan Ahmad, Dr. Arvind Panda, Dr. Khursid Alam, and Dr. Bipendra D.K. Rai to unmute their mic and participate in this panel discussion. Dr. Sanjay. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Pawan. And I hope you can see my slides. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yes we can, Sanjay. Perfect, perfect. Hi, hi, Rizwan. Good to see you. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Madars Bakar, you need to unmute your mic. You are one of our key faculty. Okay, so, uh, so we have an interesting 30 minutes of, of case discussion on overactive bladder. And uh, I have no disclosures. I speak to you from Hyderabad in India. Uh, most of you know where Hyderabad is. I invite you to Hyderabad whenever you can. We will skip all this because of want of time, but there's a lot to see in Hyderabad. Um, we have got three different cases here to, to, uh, with three different objectives. The first case is a 50-year-old woman, and this is to establish the baseline evaluation and management. The second case is an overactive bladder symptoms in a 60-year-old male to examine managing storage symptoms in a male patient with an element of avoiding dysfunction. And the third patient is a patient with refractory urgency incontinence, a 60-year-old female. We have uh, uh, five, five excellent faculty with us, Professor Madars Bakar, Dr. Rizwan, Dr. Uh, uh, Khurshidul Alam, Dr. Bibendra uh, 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 Rai, and uh, uh, Dr. Arvind Panda. So uh, welcome to all my faculty. 
and we will, the faculty are blind to the material that I'm showing here. And this is absolutely non-confrontational, a very friendly discussion. Please raise your finger if you want me to, uh, to come to you. And if I don't, because I don't see everybody's face here, you can interrupt me. But please give brief answers. Uh, and the audience is very welcome to participate. Uh, so the first patient. So this is a patient uh, in whom, as you can see, one moment, sorry. Uh, in my video, right. Yeah, so this, this is a 50 year old woman. She has urinary frequency urgency. She has no voiding difficulty, dysuria or fever. She has no neurological, gynecological or gastrointestinal symptoms. She's postmenopausal, has an unremarkable clinical exam, no major prolapse, mild vaginal mucosal atrophy. So more or less run of the mill overactive bladder uh, presentation in a 50 year old female. And uh, uh, her evaluation, her urine examination was normal, so there was no microscopic hematuria, there was no pyuria. Uh, so let me ask my faculty now, uh, the plan at this stage, so at this step, what else would you need? Uh, can I ask uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Alam? Dr. Alam, would you like any other evaluation at this point? Thank you. I want to extrude the causes which may precipitate the symptoms of overactive bladder, such as frequency and uh, urgency, yeah, but he has, she has no nocturia. So I, I want to extrude the other causes of overactive bladder that may cause this. Okay, so, so let me give you this stem that a, a detailed assessment was done and no other diagnosis was noted. Yes. So any, anything else you would like at this point, or is this enough for you to start treatment or initiate treatment? Bladder diary is important. Bladder diary is three, important. Three-day bladder diary is important. Uh, Dr. Bipender, anything else you would like other than the bladder diary? Uh, apart from the bladder diary, I, I, I think uh, I want to get her the degree of broth that she's uh, facing. Perfect. And uh, that's, that's very important for me to basically start go ahead with what uh, whether she is bothered okay. or not. That's the most so, important as, point. As Dr. Bipender said, degree of bother is very important to ascertain and you could do it either by asking the patient a question or you could do it by, uh, by some form of a questionnaire. And here you can see the patient perception of bladder condition, which is a single question answer, which shows a, a PPBC of four by six, which is a severe, uh, a moderately severe bother. Uh, and the patient scores high on urgency scores. The frequency, so this patient, we have a frequency volume chart and I'll summarize this frequency volume chart that Dr. Alam had asked for. Uh, you can see here that the patient has voided 14 times over 24 hours, including twice in the night. The mean voided volume is low at about 130 ml and the maximum voided volume is 180. Uh, uh, the total 24 hour voided volume is 1.8 liters. Uh, so now uh, can I ask my faculty, so uh, Rizwan, are you happy with this much for, for taking a decision? Uh, I think it pretty much shows that she's got a small capacity, frequency okay. is there, so does, if I'm, half of my screen is covered, but I think she gets up twice at night, is that right? That's right. That's right. So I think she has got frequency and noxuria, she's 50. In my practice, I always get a flow rate and a post-void residue. I know that the patient has got no voiding symptoms, just reassuring for me that she's not leaving anything behind. Not the least that later on with the treatment, if she complains of voiding dysfunction, we know where it started off from. It's a non-invasive investigation. So in addition to the those two, I'll get that and start her off with conservative treatment. If you want, I can, I mean, the same thing, lifestyle alterations, fluid balance, the usual things, but I would always start them on anticholinergics to start off with rather than withholding it uh, initially. So when I, I see you do these things and start her off. So, so Rizwan, you are going by the Urology Society of India guidelines rather than by your own, your own guidelines because your guidelines don't demand the post void residual and the flow, but ours does. I, I think it's very sensible. <laughs> right. So for, for various reasons, our guidelines requires it. The, the USI guidelines of 2019 and this patient's post void residual was negligible. Um, so treatment plan at this moment, at this point, Arvind, what would be your treatment plan? I more or less agree. Uh, I more or less agree with uh, what Dr. Rizwan said that uh, because the, it's, it's a low post for residual urine, I would start her on on anticholinergics, and I would I would also advise her to to, to reduce the water intake. I mean, this one point eight is okay for most of this thing, and then it, it is also important if she can uh, do some pelvic floor exercises that might help a little bit. 
Right. And I would uh, reevaluate her maybe um, after a couple of weeks. Sure. I don't wait too long. A couple of weeks, if it is not working because the bother is so much, we may have to add a supplementary therapy if this is not working. Okay. Um, Professor Manas Bakar, would you would you agree with an upfront uh, initiation of both drug therapy and conservative therapies at the same time, or would you like to sequence them? Your mic is off, sir. Your mic is off, sir. We can't hear you. Your mic is off. Your mic is off, sir. Oh, somebody will have to call and uh, get yeah, him. Uh, Miss Aditi, would you? Okay, so so, so the, the bladder training has, has been defined, I believe, for the first time in our guidelines in 2019. And I'm not going to read the definition here, but the definition is, is self-explanatory and helps to us to understand what bladder training is. For want of time, I will go on to the, the next steps. This patient had persistent bother at three weeks and then initiated drug therapy. So now I'm going to ask my faculty, what drug therapy would you choose for this? What drug therapy would you choose for this patient? Uh, so let me ask uh, Rizwan. Rizwan, what would be your drug of choice? Uh, I start them on solifenacin, five milligrams once daily. I feel uh, like I think I will say that I, I tell, give them five milligrams once daily. Tell them in two weeks time, if you've got no benefit, go up to 10 milligrams. Okay. And it's working again by the NHS, so I can't see them in two weeks. So the earliest I can see them is four weeks, and I think by that time they are pretty much decided whether they get benefit okay. or not or the side effects. Dr. Martas Bakar, sir, what would be your sure. drug of choice? Well, I, I, I would say I would uh, I would explain her the situation as 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 good as possible. Then I would start with behavioral treatment, but I would initially. Uh, uh, give also a, a drug therapy okay. because it helps also uh, to have to um, f f f for the behavioral training programs. Okay. Uh, uh, Arvind, would you start with Mira Begron, Solifenesin, anti muscarinic, or Mira Begron? Yeah, so now, this is, uh, I, 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 I did not see the Euroflowmetry, but if the Euroflowmetry is not done. I would do one, but okay. if the Euroflowmetry is not showing an obstruction, I would go up with at least 10 milligrams of soliferous and that would be my first choice. And okay. I would add on Mira Begron uh, after two weeks if she's not getting benefited. Okay. Uh, Dr. Alam, do you believe that there is some method by which we could phenotype patients and decide what drug they use? Do you think there is, we have that kind of data with us to decide which drug for which type of patient, a subclassification, so to say? There are now uh, phenotyping the patients. Uh, if there is pelvic block dysfunction and something other uh, age related or other changes in the bladder, then uh, some drugs may not be effective in these overactive bladders. This one, do you this one, do you think we have enough information to phenotype patients and decide on drugs? Yes, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think at, sometimes what I do is to, when you discuss with the patients the side effects, I must admit now I do discuss with them the uh, JAMA study that with the long-term use of oxybutane, there might be some evidence that you can develop cognitive impairment and then give them the choice that you want to start off with Myra background first. In my experience, I think hardly anybody does that. Mostly they want to try solifenacin first. But I think right. the one... Sorry, so she was initiated on five milligrams of solifenacin. She was about 50% better by four weeks. And at that point, the plan again was we had several options and I'll cut this short because of want of time. So we've already discussed some of this. So the options are to either escalate to 10 milligrams, add Mira Begron, add a second anti muscarinic or add a dirty drug like flavoxate or emitripline or so on. In this patient, we added uh, Mira Begron to this patient. Both of these are our first line agents. I will skip this except to say that there's not much to choose between the efficacy of various anti muscarinic drugs. Uh, they are more or less equal in their efficacy, although you do not have good head-to-head -head comparisons between all of them. So it's, it's sketchy evidence from network meta-analyses uh, uh, by and large. And regarding combinations, it's quite clear that the combination of Mira Begron with an anti-muscarinic is, is more efficacious than either drug alone with acceptable adverse effect side effects. And hence, it probably makes better sense to escalate to, to, uh, to, to add Mira Begron rather than to escalate to a higher dose of the anti muscarinic And that's what our guidelines suggest. There is some concern regarding long-term dementia, and this seems to be a dose-response relationship. 
uh, especially a, a recent cohort study showed this over 12 years of follow and it appears that even short term exposure to antimuscarinics actually might have an impact um, for these reasons i am now going to ask rizwan and professor maders bakar again if you did not have a cost issue with the mira begron if there was no cost or availability issue would you use mira begron as the first choice for your patients assume same cost easy availability um in our in our area i think we can't hear him drug of choice is trostil chloride is the first drug so okay. i would prefer an antimuscarinic uh, and then uh, if there are no if there are no contraindications right there is one only, uh, yeah uh, to be honest, i i couldn't hear professor mathis bakker but i think i would choose uh, now what i tend to do is to offer them both without give, give, uh, pros and cons of both the medications and pro i have got a tendency to be honest to start at least the younger patient on mira background more and more uh, I, like you said efficacy is more or less the same because this slight doubt of dementia i much rather err on the side of caution we know that mira background is very safe so i've got increasing tendency to use it as first line okay so last uh, quick question or quick thought the trostium chloride is very yeah. safe in regards to to central side effects sure. so i would I, i would always start with a monotherapy and i also look a little bit on the price to be economic right. so the only prob uh, the problem uh, professor is that it, there appears to be evidence that the cumulative dementia rate with antimuscarinics seems to be there despite with, with these drugs and it seems to be there with all the antimuscarinics even with solifenes no, no 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 i have to correct you the trostium chloride does not pass the blood brain barrier and therefore trostium chloride does not induce cerebral side effects Right. So, Sanjay, Sanjay, sorry, can I ask? It might be me, but I can't hear Professor Madras Bakker. Can everybody else can hear him? I mean, yes. I can hear everybody else, but not him. Okay, I will. I will leave it at that. Except to say that immediate cognitive dysfunction and long-term dementia are two different issues, and we still have concerns regarding long-term dementia. Wow. We don't have good quality studies on long-term. I think I'll leave it at that. Correct. Correct. And in addition, I want to say. We do not really know if mirabegon has no side effects. Agreed, agreed, absolutely, absolutely. It's absolutely. not yet proven. Not proven. Agreed. I agree entirely, sir. Right. Uh, so I will, I will skip to the next patient. This is a 60-year-old male with frequency, urgency, which are dominant, mild voiding symptoms, no dysuria, no GI or neurological symptoms, a 40-gram benign prostate, a normal focused neurourological exam, and he's diabetic. Uh, he has mild mild voiding difficulty so i correct myself here and say that we should not call this overactive bladder we should call it lutz so this is a patient with lower tract symptoms storage dominant in a male patient uh, the approach to this patient again the urine exam normal and the plan so let me ask uh, dr bipender now is the plan dr bipender the same as for the female patients your evaluation uh for <clears throat> for the male patient in contrast to female patient i think uh voiding <clears throat> urophometry is uh, would probably come as a as a first line approach in contrast to female where probably uroflow would not be an option and again uh, post void residual urine would also be an important part of the assessment as compared to female in uh, early part of the assessment i think so if you look at the eau guidelines or if you look at the uk nice guidelines they don't require for you that you should do an ultrasound scan and check the residual and do a flow test for patients with overactive bladder symptoms but in a male patient and even in a female patient as you can see rizwan said we feel more comfortable having checked the post void residue and certainly the flow in a male patient so this is this patient's flow a 10 ml per second flow rate of somewhat flattish flow uh, with a low post void residue 50 ml over a pre void volume about 290 uh, what do you do now let me ask dr alam your approach sir dr alam hey i see the upper tract if there is any upper tract deterioration or i see normal. normal normal kidneys and normal normal renal function What what is his age? Oh, he's he assumes sixty years. Let's say sixty years. Yeah. So mild voiding. So I I observe him with behavioral modification, and 
Okay, so this is his bladder diary, and you can see here he in 24 hours he's passed about 1.8 liters. Again, his mean voided volume is on the lower side. Uh, he has borderline nocturnal polyuria, is 33, 34 percent. Although this does not seem to be the main bothersome symptom for him, his frequency, urgency, overall bothers him, and nocturia is a part of it, of course. Uh, which symptom score? I think we'll skip that for want of time. Okay, uh, the plan for this patient. So this patient, we have several choices and I'm going to put the options first on the table and then I'm going to ask my faculty. You have an option of using one drug. You could use either an alpha blocker, mirabegron, and an anti-muscarinic. You could use a com combination of drugs, either an alpha blocker with mirabegron, an alpha blocker with an anti-muscarinic, or all the three. You could use sequential drugs, give an alpha blocker and add an OEB drug or the other way around, or you could use other drugs like PD-5 inhibitors. So now let me ask Dr. Arvind, Arvind, what would be your plan for this patient? Uh, this is interesting. I, I, would, I would also evaluate his diabetes. Uh, that's something. Okay. Right. So, so let's assume done, diabetes well controlled. Okay. Good. I, I would initially, you know, it's a 40 gram prostate. So I would add an alpha blocker with a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor first. And then sequentially, I go ahead, go on to add the Mira Begron later. So it would be comfortable, Arbin, giving a 5-alpha reductase despite the fact that the dominant store symptoms are storage here? You would like to give two drugs for voiding? I would wait for a little bit. I would wait maybe for a, for a couple of weeks. And uh, and if if there is still, and it still has storage symptoms, I would add it. Definitely, if after two weeks, I would add. If it doesn't improve at all. Because okay. though though his dominant features here are storage, uh, there is there is a possibility that this uh, that these symptoms are due to the uh, secondary to the obstruction. So I would try to to, to rule that out, do that out first. But having said that, uh, you we can always have a uh, so-called uh, you know um, underactive bladder with a sure. overactive component. Okay. That can happen. Okay, uh, uh, Rizwan, what would be your choice? Would you start with the alpha blocker? No, I think I'll do in the combined alpha blockers with Myra Begron, and reason is he's got a residue of 50 mils. I'd much rather treat the patient, his symptoms, it, give him this confidence they should working and then withdraw the drugs. In my experience, if you start with alpha blockers, half of them are never happy and they lose the confidence. So I've got evidence for this, but there is evidence that both of them work better than one alone, and that's what I'm going to do. Rizwan, you should be practicing in Hyderabad. <laughs> Pragmatic approach. I use the same in UK also. Professor, Professor Madarsbakar, what would be your choice of drug for this patient? I would start with an alpha blocker for two weeks. Okay. Control him, see the, how the flow has changed. If he has still symptoms of the overactive bladder, I would add Mira Begron. Okay. Any difference of opinion? Pardon me? I'm just asking the others whether they have a difference of opinion. Yeah. Now, okay, so I'll tell you what we did for this patient. This patient was initiated on Mira Begron 50 milligrams as a single uh, modality and was told to add the tamsulosin if the response was unsatisfactory or if there was increase in voiding difficulty uh, and to return after six weeks to the bladder diary without stopping medication. Uh, alternate, I'm now going to just come to some alternative settings. So I'm going to give you three different scenarios of male patients. The first is no voiding symptoms and you evaluate the patient and there is no abnormality in voiding on the evaluation. The second situation is no voiding symptoms, but your evaluation shows an element of voiding dysfunction. Let's say the residual is high or the flow is slow. And the third is patient has voiding symptoms and also has evaluation, which is abnormal. And now I'm going to give you four different scenarios here just to ask you a little to understand from you. So the patient has no symptoms of voiding difficulty has abnormality in flow and residual. You can see 100 by 300. In this kind of a patient, let's say, uh, uh, Rizwan, what would be your approach for this patient? Uh, I, I am a great fan of urodynamics. So I will do urodynamics on this patient because I want to absolutely prove if he's clearly obstructed and he's kind of a young, then I think you need to have outflow surgery. And this so, is my so, advice. Rizwan, I'm going to interrupt you there because I know we're a little short in time also. I would be happy with that approach for this patient. I hope you can see my cursor. So the patient has, so this group of patients, he's got voiding symptoms and he's got a poor flow with a large residue uh, or maybe here. But for a patient who doesn't have voiding symptoms, I'm not sure that this patient is immediately facing surgery. So no non-invasive treatment, non-invasive assessment. That's what I would have thought. Oh, yeah, so I, I thought we have already treated it conservatively and it has failed conservatively. Oh, no, no, this is, I'm so sorry. I'm so, this is, this, I'm just giving you a fresh set of three, you know, conditions. They're just putting your mind, you know, kind of uh, some thoughts in people's mind to try and understand how to approach these. 
I, I think in that case, this has got a high pre-void. Uh, uh, it's a pre-void or a post-void. So this is P, the PVR is 100. The pre-void is 300 here. For this patient, the PVR is 50%, 150 by 300. As we know, with the number of studies, there is no definite uh, post-void residue which we can call significant. So, uh, the one which actually I use is if they leave, leave more than 10, certainly more than 20%, then I'm slightly concerned that, that that is a patient who might end up into difficulty, especially if you treat them with anticholinergics. And that is my reason of treating them with myrabagol. So, so one thing, I, one comment that I would like to say is, especially for a patient who's presented predominantly with storage symptoms, once the patient's void percentage starts coming down, so this patient has a 50% void percentage, this is a sign that tackling the, the voiding difficulty or voiding problem can actually resolve the storage problem. Because if the patient has a poor void percentage and is having outlet obstruction, and if you relieve the obstruction and the patient's voiding efficiency improves, the odds are the storage symptoms would improve. So I would be more inclined to, to, to manage aggressively, especially if they've got symptoms, this particular group rather than this one. Uh, but certainly, as you said, if the patient is not responding, I would be very keen to do a urodynamics and check how the patient's uh, bladder function is. Uh, any any uh, thoughts, Professor Madars Bakar, on this, these presentations? Well, I, I would follow the, the, the uh, Ritz one, that even in the patients with a, with a, with a 300 pre-void and 150 PVR, and even in the other one with, with a 100, 100 cc post-void residual urine, his flow is really poor. He's a young guy, uh, relatively young. So I, I would do a, a, a pressure flow study. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just briefly, very briefly, a little bit of uh, evidence here. anti combined with an alpha blocker are clearly safe in patients who have ma male patients with lower tract symptoms. anti alone in patients who have an outlet obstruction without an alpha blocker is also safe by and large. And this has been shown in a large study by Professor Abrams long back in 2006. Uh, anti alone in patients with underactivity men is also safe. Uh, and I, I won't go into the details of all this. Uh, Mira Begron for men, again, both combined as well as alone in patients obstructed seems to be safe. By and large, patients don't tend to go into retention when you put them on anti or Mira <laughs> Begron. Uh, although I must add, as Professor Madars Bakar said, we don't know everything about Mira Begron. And you can see in the studies, the systematic review with Mira Begron, you can look here that there is an increase in the post void residual with Mira Begron, which is significant, statistically significant with Mira Begron. So, although the teaching classically is Mira Begron doesn't impact voiding, but you can see here in a large systematic review, a slight increase in the post-void residual seen in multiple studies, even with Mira Begron. So we, the final answer is not there with Mira Begron. We don't know many things about it, including long-term effects and so on. And also there is probably some impact on voiding, which we are not very clear about right now. So we do need to study it more to understand it better. Uh, okay, now... Right, so let me go to the last case, and this is refractory urgency incontinence, incontinence in a 60-year-old female. She has bothersome urinary urgency incontinence despite conservative measures and combination overactive bladder medication. She has no voiding difficulty or dysuria, no neurological, gynecological, or gastrointestinal symptoms, and an unremarkable clinical examination. Uh, so what's the plan for the poor responders? We are a little short on time, so I'm going to rush through this and not ask the panelists. Look at the fluid balance, look at drug compliance, patient expectations, change the drug or add a dose if not done, recheck residuals if you started off with a marginal residual especially, consider a different diagnosis, uh, as, uh, look for neurological problems which might now be manifest in the follow-up and such patients might have a slightly higher prevalence of bladder pain syndrome. So be, keep an open mind in patients who are not responsive. Uh, we have already, Pavan has mentioned to you, and I will again re-emphasize the definition of refractory urgency incontinence. The USI guidelines of 2019 define refractory urgency incontinence as a patient who fails to respond to combination therapy as well. So if you look at the AUA guideline, it does not ask, require of you the combination therapy usage. And the second is avoiding diary has to be examined as a part of the definition. So if you have not examined avoiding diary, you cannot label the patient as refractory. Um, 
So a key learning objective, do not label a patient refractory without a bladder diary. And I'll just put this in perspective by showing you what the EAU guidelines and the AUA guidelines tell you. The EAU guidelines of 2020 does not make a specific recommendation in terms of urodynamics, uh, it, uh, but it does say that the uh, urodynamic findings do not have an impact on the outcomes of botulinum toxin and sacral neuromodulation. The EAU guidelines of 2020 uses the term refractory, but does not define it anywhere. The AUA guideline of 2020 mentioned that in some cases, a specialist might want to obtain further information by doing, for instance, uh, urodynamics. But it also says that in some cases, the specialist may opt to do avoiding diary. And that to me sounds fairly uh, 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 strange to say the least, because you cannot make a diagnosis of refractory without avoiding diary. So it's not a question of some cases, you must have avoiding diary in a patient before you label a patient as refractory. And hence the USI guidelines of 2019 incorporates it into the definition of refractory urgency incontinence. Uh, the approach, as I said, this is done. Now, the, the, the USI guideline requires of us to do a urodynamics before proceeding with treatment. This is not to make a diagnosis of detrus oval activity, but to exclude alternate diagnoses, which are not uncommon. So things like voiding dysfunction and so on, which is not uncommon uh, in our country, at least. And because there is significant implication of using uh, making a diagnosis of refractory, because it opens up a large number of it opens up costly and potentially invasive therapies. Okay, so uh, it's, so we would do a urodynamics. So I'm going to ask uh, Professor Helmut Madersbacher, sir, if you are doing a urodynamics in a patient with refractory urgency incontinence, would you stop the medications before you do it? No, I, I um, she. She, when she is on, on medication, she has the, the, the problems, I would not stop because I, I would like to see, no, no, sorry, uh, vice versa. In this case, to see what the underlying pathophysiology, it's better to stop the medication three or four days and then to do, do the urinamics. Rizwan, would you stop or not stop? Yes, I don't stop because I want to see that even on medication, what the status is. Because now I want to go to the next level. But I do understand where Prof is coming from. Arvind, stop, not stop. I would not stop because, again, as he said, uh, I want to know um, um, what, Look, is, Alan, what is the Stop, effect? not stop. No, no, I don't stop the drug. Bipendan? Yeah, I have to continue with the drug because... Uh, I can understand Professor Madars Barker's position, and it's it's a it's a, it's a good academic position. Uh, I think it. Uh, I wouldn't normally stop it, but it, I can understand that. So you can see here, this patient has detrus overactivity with incontinence. Uh, and uh, normally we would not stop. So this patient has DO incontinence. Uh, uh, what about treatment? So at this point, let me ask my panelists, Professor Madars Barker, what would be your plan for treatment? Well, she had... If she has had already medications, uh, pharmacotherapy, and uh, which which did not work, I mean the next step for me is is a, is a third line treatment and botulinum toxin. Okay, so I think we have kind of agreed on this. Would anybody uh, uh, do anything other than botulinum toxin? Rizwan, would you put a sacral neuromodulator on her? I said to be honest, I, I will have a skewed view. The reason is that I'm fortunate to work in a department where not only sacral neuromodulation. We have got posterior tibial stimulation also. So we offer all three to all newcomers. And interestingly, in spite of what anybody else says, patients are actually one third, one third, one third now who choose, and you can't predict which patient is going to choose which mm -hmm. one. But that I've got the luxury to do that. Otherwise, Botox will be the first line treatment. Right, so, so 100 units of botulinum toxin was injected into 20 sites for this patient. Uh, she is satisfied with the, the, her symptoms. She does not have urgency incontinence, but she does have some amount of urgency still. Uh, no voiding dysfunction. And as you can see, it's, it's a strong recommendation and a, and a moderate recommendation for either botulinum or sacral neuromodulation in the guidelines. Um, and when you do urodynamics for patients with refractory urgency incontinence, for the residents and trainees who are watching this, there are several things you may find. You could get detrus overactivity with or without incontinence on the study. You might find urgency but not be able to document DO. 
you may just get early sensations and a reduced capacity urodynamic stress incontinence might masquerade as urgency incontinence urodynamic mixed incontinence might masquerade as urgency incontinence you could get cough associated detrusive overactivity incontinence you could just get reduced compliance in certain settings you could get an alternate diagnosis neurogenic or voiding dysfunction or you could in fact get a normal study and a normal study does not exclude the possibility of using botulinum toxin in the patient provided you have 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 excluded other diagnoses in the patient uh i am now going to just show two or three uh, tracings to my faculty and ask them what they would do and i hope you can see this the entire slide uh you can see here that there is detrusive or overactivity with incontinence and this patient also has urodynamic stress incontinence so this is a patient who is refractory and these are the findings on the urodynamics uh, uh, rizwan what would you do i think by definition i try to treat the patient and not the investigation so i'll ask the patient what is her predominant symptom if that is stress incontinence i'll treat that first but warn her that your detrusive overactivity related symptoms might get worse and might need treatment later on i mean she's come with re she's come with refractory urgency incontinence okay. that that be the case i'll treat this one first but tell her that you've got stress incontinence and that might need treatment later on but in a in a large proportion of patients when you treat these ones with botulinum toxin the stress incontinence actually for some reason disappears but you need to warn them okay i'm going to show the next tracing and ask professor martyrs bakar about it professor this is a different patient this is cough associated detrusive overactivity type 2 which we reported in 2019 you can see here I, i don't know whether it's i hope it's not covered in your slide by in your in your screen by your faces uh, this patient has cough associated detrusive overact overactivity but the leakage happens with the cough not with the phasic contraction so this is a type 2 cado where leak happens with the stress but not with the phasic contraction so there is detrusive overactivity there is cough associated detrusive overactivity but the leak happens with the stress professor martyrs bakar well um, uh, cl clinically uh, which, which symptoms are predominant so she has presented with urgency incontinence but the problem is you know that some urgent stress incontinence especially with isd patients sometimes might present as urgency incontinence when they actually have uh, have stress incontinence on the on the urodynamic she doesn't have detrusive overactivity incontinence but she's got cough associated detrusive overactivity but she doesn't leak leak with the phasic contraction she leaks with the cough uh was was any treatment done for for the two so activity so far so she's used combined medical therapy and she's used conservative therapy but no no botulinum injections but she i uh, could understand the last one she's not she's not had invasive therapies she's had all non invasive drug therapies conservative therapies everything and and she still has 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 symptoms of ob and stress incontinence yeah mm -hmm. well in 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 this case uh, i mean it is uh, if if you do anything against the stress and contents first you 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 should uh, you should have the tools under control and uh, as uh, as uh, rich one said sometimes when you treat the tools or activity and then only only uh, stress and contents uh, persists it might be tolerable for the patient or you can do it with a conservative way okay arbind i'm going to give you another one this is type 3 cough associated detrusive overactivity here you can see that the patient again has cough associated detrusive overactivity but the leak is happening both with the stress at the, the same cough, time as well as, as, as well as with the phasic contractions so you can see leakage happening with both so this is well, the that we reported in 2019 but in in in, in this case i i, I would i would correct uh, I, I would do a operation for stress incontinence because mostly then in this situation also the the the, the tools are calms down. Okay. okay, I agree totally that uh, in this case uh, it would be good to do a uh, so operation for the stress stress incontinence. Yes, So if you are happy doing us an operation for stress incontinence here where the patient has detrusive overactivity incontinence also why would you not be happy to operate here where the patient doesn't have detrusive overactivity incontinence just has stress incontinence we would prefer to treat the you understand here the phasic contraction you don't see leak with the phasic contraction in this patient you see leak with both the phasic contraction and the stress incontinence is there so i would expect that you would be more inclined to operate the first patient rather than the second one the previous one rather than this one 
the previous one if we do if we, if you if you do actually in the inject botox uh, that uh, that's not you know that's not so irreversible as it's a, it's a matter of the degree of 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 invasiveness rizwan what are your thoughts uh, I, i was going to say i think you are right in raising this question in in my experience for the one with the isd yeah even if you treat, treat the do they continue to have incontinence right and that is why i think prof is saying you treat the stress component first here it's more likely that when you treat the refractory overactivity the second case incontinence will improve to Correct. my mind both of them will require a, a stress incontinence operation sooner or later the reason i think all of us are inclined to treat the oab uh, refractory first because they are kind of a less invasive so the side effects of botulinum toxin or neuromodulation are less than when you put a tape in your rectus fascia sling so i think we try to do the minimally invasive first and hope that is going to work right so we don't have evidence based answers for all this so all the answers that all the faculty have given are fine because you don't really have evidence based answers uh, right. we've already discussed choosing the right therapy as a part of pavan's presentation we are at the end of our time so i am really going to say a thank you very much to our faculty thank you very much professor madras bakar rizwan dr alam bipender and arabin this been a privilege to be uh, interacting with you for this uh, brief case discussion session and thank you to the audience and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to do this with you thank you very much and back to uh, uh, pavan pavan thank you so much yes uh, thank you dr sanjay for moderating this case based discussion so nicely and i am also thankful to all our panelists uh, dr helmut dr rizwan dr arbin panda dr khursi dalam and dr bipendra dikirai uh, so we are almost at the end of this program so and i would like to request uh, secretary of bows Dr. Toi Dem Hussain, uh, to extend his vote of thanks to all our faculties and the participants. Dr. Toi, please. Uh, your mic is mute. Please unmute your mic. Well, thanks to Dr. Pawn, Secretary General of Sarc Association of Urological Surgeons, and also the Secretary of uh, Nepal Urological Association of Surgeons, um, for excellent moderation of today's program. and we passed almost 3 hours time uh, without uh, no blinking of eyes so i must congratulate all the viewers those who are uh, present from the uh, starting to till now and uh, thank you very much for all of their ownness of the sark association of urological surgeons and you see friends often uh, in our clinical practice we see the patients of oab feel embarrassed but i firmly believe after this successful uh, webinar on update of overactive bladder um, uh, definitely we will not feel embarrassed to treat the uh, our oab patient efficiently and in this regards i must thanks to our honorable president uh and immediate past president of uh, urology society of india and our south president now professor modues agarwal for his visionary leadership and mentorship of uh, south for advancing urology in this region uh, in the sark region and secondly the uh, treasurer of the south and he is also the very dynamic secretary of the urology society of india how he saw uh, his efficiency uh, during this pandemic uh, who organizes so many so many so many webinar uh, in the last 5 uh, to 6 months uh, so he engaged every urologist not to uh, very much depressed due to this pandemic situation he is uh, uh, professor rajiv tp and he is very dynamic uh, and uh, visionary secretary of usi and uh, and uh, i must give thanks to our pawn is very dynamic who is the mover of this uh, sark urology association of surgeons uh, um, he is always ready to do what uh, uh, professor modhu sir and uh, professor rajiv tp plan and he is always ready to execute this plan so thank you pawn and i must give thanks to professor helmut madas uh, baker uh professor kishtopat chapel uh, the helmut you know that he is the president of in uh, um uh, international neurourological society 
and Professor uh, Christopher Chapel, who was not uh, uh, present in the webinar directly, but he uh, gave uh, the pre-recorded uh, uh, audio lecture. And also the Dr. Rizwan Hamid. Uh, you all see, uh, give uh, the height of our today's program. And I must congratulate from the South to you. And God bless you all. And uh, the Sanjay Sinha, uh, we know him from the very uh, early days. He's just so outspoken, so knowledgeable, uh, and so uh, philosophical uh, talk he always gives. And for his excellent moderation uh, from the South, we give him the, a huge congratu congratulation. And I must give uh, uh, my heartiest uh, congrats to the, all the speakers of today's speakers uh, for their excellent evidence-based talk. And in these regards, I must give thanks to all the national society to put the right person uh, in the right talk. And congratulations to all the national society uh, for uh, their excellent job. And all the panel of experts uh, of today's uh, 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 um, case-based discussion, uh, they gave uh, the height of the uh, very lively discussion. So I must congress the, all the panel of experts from the different uh, uh, region. And finally, I give thanks to uh, our today's scientific partner, the Sun Pharma and our co-host, uh, the uh, Aditi Das Gupta and other uh, personnel of Sun Pharma. And uh, lastly, I hope and pray uh, there are all common interests of the Sark region. We believe our disease pattern is the same. Our treatment plan is almost same. Our armamentarium is almost same. And our opportunity is almost the same. Our level of education is almost same. And in these regards, I always respect the Indian Urology Society and uh, Indian experts who help us, the or lots of uh, neighboring uh, country urologists to develop. And uh, hope and pray we will work together and to develop our advancing urology in this region and not only the urology and even to overcome the this pandemic COVID-19 in regards to uh, giving the uh, sharing of the knowledge and also to giving sharing the vaccine if uh, India um, uh, will make to uh, made vaccine very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for patience sharing. Thank you again Professor Modu sir, Professor Rajiv Tipi and Dr. Pawan and all the experts, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koi. And, and see you soon, inshallah, uh, in person. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Toit, uh, for your nice words. So I would like to share that uh, today's webinar was viewed by 358 participants from different uh, countries across the world. And uh, they were participants from 10 different countries, including SAR. And uh, so finally, uh, I would request our president, Dr. Madhu, to end this webinar with his uh, ending remarks. Dr. Madhu, sir. Well, friends, thank you all uh, very much for being a part of this program. Uh, our, our strength is in being together. And uh, together, we'll, like Dr. what Dr. Tohid said, to face our medical problems together and face this uh, unprecedented pandemic together. And I wish and pray for health to all of you and your families. And may you all uh, pass through the remaining period of this turbulent times safely. And may we all meet in person soon enough so let us hope for this to be over and let us have uh, the uh, times uh, like our Kochi Yusikon back again when we can be together and we can enjoy again. So thank you very much. Thank you all the faculty and uh, participants uh, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Helmut. And thank you all. Thank you.